example of somebody that I got to know just a little while ago. In fact, quite a while ago, about seven months ago. And this gentleman has gone through a lot of these concepts with me personally and has really taught me a lot about uh, success and how to be successful. And um, God, I can't say enough about this gentleman. Why don't I just uh, introduce him up here? Would you please help me welcome up our guest today, Mr. Lawrence Thompson. We, no, we're fine. You want to call back there? Thank you very much. I really appreciate all of you coming out here today. I must admit that our flyers say millionaire training. It's got to be a little bit enticing to want to know what this is all about. Uh, we're going to share some ideas with you here today that have helped a lot of us over the years, especially myself, uh, become successful. Uh, and success is always relative to uh, uh, where you are and where you've, where you've been. And so that's kind of some of the things that we're going to share with you here today. It's, it's an exciting day for me. Uh, since Herbalife got started, since my first meeting at Herbalife and being involved with it, uh, this is a training class that Mark and I have talked about uh, since day one. And so we're really excited about this, to be able to share some of the things with you, aside from our product line, aside from our marketing system, that uh, a very important part to make your business work. And, and I, myself, like Doug, uh, we really appreciate those of you that have taken the time that are not part of Herbalife. We're certainly welcome to take some notes here today. And, and if this can benefit you and your business or your job or your profession or career, you're certainly welcome to some of these ideas. But we're going to be talking about Herbalife primarily, but you'll be able to use some of these concepts uh, in all areas of your life. You know, <laughs> I was sitting back there, standing back there in the room, back of the room here earlier, and I saw all the people out here, and I could feel the excitement. And uh, it might kind of made me you know, a little humble here to come up here and share some of these things with you, because my, I have to share a few things with you here so you can understand. The things that I'm going to share with you today are things that are part of my life. They're part of me. They're not things that I've developed. They're things that were shared with me about 13 years ago uh, that uh, made sense to me. And I started applying some of these things to my life and it started making a significant change in it. Uh, my background prior to that was strictly construction work. That's all I'd, I'd ever known in my life was doing construction work. I uh, lived up in a small city up north near San Jose. How many know where Livermore, California is? Can I see it? Is that right? <laughs> you certainly all weren't there at the same time. I wouldn't know the strangers in town. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Uh, but uh, I lived up there. I went to school up there. And it was just a small city. And I grew up doing construction work. Because uh, my dad did construction work. And my brothers did it. And a couple of my cousins. And so we kind of had our own built-in crew there. And, and I started doing it in the summers in between school at, at, at 13. And, and I liked it. And, uh, and I never thought about ever doing anything different than construction work. That's the only thing I'd ever thought about. It wasn't necessarily a goal or anything. It was just that that's what I, uh, I grew up and I was going to do it and that's how it was going to be. And I do remember this, so I, I remember that my, my income goal, I did have an income goal back then, and that was to uh, earn $25,000 a year. I knew back then, I said, if I can just get to $25,000 a year, I'm going to have it made. And, and that's the only real goal as I understood it at that point. And here it is, uh, you know, springtime now, right? We're right, getting ready to go into our spring season. And I know what would be happening. I would be getting ready to come right out of the rainy season like I had all the other previous years if I hadn't have been fortunate enough to get exposed to an opportunity in 1968. And I never will forget that. And, and I'd, I'd like to take a couple of minutes here and share that with you. Uh, what had happened was it was my first exposure uh, into the, the sales industry, the direct sales industry as we have here in Herbalite. And uh, a good friend of mine had found a, a, a little part-time business that he'd been uh, exposed to. And he got a hold of me one night. His name was Mike Fuller. And Mike Fuller was also in construction work. And Mike Fuller, I really respected him because Mike was different than, than most of the construction workers I work with because he had a couple of homes and he had a few dollars put aside. So I respected him besides liking him. I, I, I respected him. And, uh, and he called me one night. It was on a Monday night. I never will forget this. And he was very excited, and Mike was not that kind of a person. And he'd start telling me about this opportunity that he'd found, and how he'd, he thought he could make some real serious money, and something would fit me like a glove. And he would, have you ever talked to someone that seemed like this walking about that high school? That's how he sounded that night. And he got my interest up. Now, 
when he got me interest, though, I, he, he called me at 6.30 at night, and he wanted me to go over to the Hyatt House Hotel in San Jose, which is a good 45 minutes away, and he wanted me to be there like at 8 o'clock. And, uh, and I was real hesitant to go. Not that, not that I was hesitant because of his excitement, or I didn't believe in him, because I was going, I, I was excited because of his excitement. And I was curious about anything that could get Mike going like that. So uh, I said, will you call me back in 10 minutes? And the reason I wanted to call that, at that time, I had real long hair down to here and uh, had a beard to match it. Uh, and I was looking pretty good, though. i got to share that with you. <laughs> you know? and, and, and so I did, my hair wasn't right. You know, and I didn't want to go to a meeting where my hair wasn't right. And so, that, so I had to go find you at the deal to see why you get it going. And then, so he called me back. I said, okay, I'm coming. And, and I was real excited about it. At first, I was real nervous and everything. And I was, I was real excited because, you know, I'd never been to a business meeting before. And so I'm going over there. And I'm, I'm, I'm really jetting around there. And, and, and I have no idea what I'm going to see. I'm more into the getting ready and going and what's going to take place than the opportunity he's talking about. And because it was a business meeting, I didn't know quite what to wear. So I put on my best beads. You know, <laughs> I do the best job I could there. You know. <laughs> I never will forget it. I went to the Hyatt House Hotel in San Jose, and any of you who have been there, you know how it is. And I, this, was, this is quite a few years ago. It's different than it is today. And I never will forget walking. That was the first time in my life, by the way, that I'd ever been in a hotel. That's the truth. I've been in a few motels before. <laughs> I've been in a hotel. There is the difference. Uh, and uh, I walked in, I never will forget, when I walked out there, my hair was down to here, and you know, I was, you know, walking, doing everything I could. <laughs> you know, if you're going to go there, you might as well do it with style. And uh, I walked in, and I know those people thought they were hallucinating. <laughs> they just, that's the first time they'd ever seen anybody like me in there. And, uh, and I walked in, and I went to the meeting, and I never will forget it. My sponsor, when it was all, uh, first of all, I came up and I sat down and everybody left. You know what I mean? It'd be kind of like today if someone that looked like that walked in a day, it would be nobody thinking anything about it, but, you know, they wouldn't exactly necessarily want their gas set next to it, right? And so, I got, everybody left. And it didn't bother me at all because I'm into everything that's happening. And I no sooner got there than the meeting started. And they got me excited that night. They started sharing some things and, 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 you know, and it got me excited. And I never really thought that anything was going to develop from me going there at all. And, but they got me excited. And when it was all over, <laughs> Mike's sponsor walked up to him and he looked at me and he says, you don't want to do this, do you? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I got started the next day. And that first week, I had some incredible things happen to me. I got off to a real good start because of, of Mike and his sponsor and some things that started happening. I got right in, uh, right away I got into a training class that was kind of like this and, and they really got my attention. And um, in the first week I earned $600 part time. And, and I was just a babbling idiot after that because I didn't think it was possible. I never made $600 full time in a week, you know, let alone part time. So it was really something for me. And I, I remember what happened at the end of that day, I, uh, the Friday, it was five days, and at the end of it, there was a gentleman came up that I used to work with, and he was coming, he was coming by to say hello, and I wanted to recruit this guy. And so I used to do cement work, so I remember drawing the marketing plan out in the cement there and telling him about how you could do all this and you can do that. And he looked at me and he said, that's so good. He said, what are you doing here, working in construction? And I said, uh, I got, you got a point. And I quit. <laughs> I got him and that impressed him. <laughs> I got him in my business. And I left. I did. I left and I left my tools and everything right there. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm not coming back. And about two hours later, I said, ooh, what did I do? You know, you, know, you get all excited, you do all these crazy things. And, and I said, well, you know, what if $600 doesn't come in next week? What's going to happen in one of these things? And, and I start going. And the most important thing that happened to me was that I got off to a real good start. And that made, you know, I, I, I believe the business could work for me. They told me it could work for me. And then it was actually working for me. And so I, that just made more excitement happen. And, uh, and I started going. And after becoming full-time, uh, uh, the first uh, couple months were real good. 
real good. And then I went through some transitions after that. After about, actually about 90 days was really positive for me. And then I had, I went through some transitions personally. And that's when these, uh, these concepts that I'm going to share with you today came into play. See, when things are moving, when things are going well, you can do anything and it'll work. But what happens when you stub your toe a little bit? What happens when you get a little confused? What happens then when you're not sure of the direction you're going in? That's when concepts like this will come into play. And it was really stuff. And <laughs> I got to tell you what, about uh, my sponsor. I never forget this. I got to share this story with you because Doug asked me if I'd share it before we got started, and I almost forgot it. But I was taking my sponsor. If any of you are familiar with up north, I was driving across from Hayward to across the San Mateo Bridge to get to the um, San Francisco Airport. And I had this black Ford. You got to understand my. I got to explain my car to you. <laughs> I mean, I started making all this money, and I had this black '62 Ford, uh, and 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 it just wasn't a normal. It was real low. I had it really lowered. <laughs> like this, you don't see you driving down the road, you know, looking good. And and so there was a couple of problems with this car. One problem was it uh, didn't ha have an emergency brake, which is no big deal. Only it didn't go in the park either. So when you stopped, <laughs> you know you had a problem, and it had it had. But I fixed that problem because I made a little cement rock about that big, and I kept it behind the seat here. And so when it, when you stopped, if it was kind of going downhill, you just eased up on it. And if you got real, you get you could get real good at it. Nobody even tell you were doing it. See, and it, just the same thing going back this way. And it had built valves in it, so if you had one of those cars, it went bloop 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 like that. And I started making all this money and stuff, and and I was still concerned. I didn't want to buy suits, and I didn't want to spend money and all this stuff. And it was just really. It was, it was different for me because uh, I, I guess I really didn't believe it was going to last was the truth of the matter and I remember taking my sponsor across the San Mateo Bridge and uh, he looked at me and, and he says I don't want to ever he had a Cadillac and he kept, kept telling all his people you got to buy a Cadillac you got if you're going to be business in business you know you're, if you start as soon as you start making the money start showing the money here start showing people that you really believe in what you're doing and that just didn't compute to me at all but it was exciting to me you know but I, I just didn't have the, enough courage to make it make it go and, and I would drive across that bridge and he says I don't want to ever ride in this dirty blank Ford again. And I said, okay. I said, but listen, you don't understand. I said, I can't afford a Cadillac yet. And he looked me right in the eyes and he said, let me tell you something, Larry. He said, you can't afford not to have a Cadillac. And I said, that makes sense to me. <laughs> and I came right back across the San Mateo Bridge. And it used to be Buchanan Smith. It's Lee Doty Cadillac up there. Now, it used to be Buchanan Smith. And I came back across there. And I said, I'm going to go get me a Cadillac. I never thinking in a million years that it was going to happen. And I pulled in and I started driving up there. And I looked up there, and first of all, when I pulled in the driveway, you got to understand, I got my say, my big tall boots on, and I got my hair down, and I got my beats, and my little shades, and I'm, you know, I got, and, you know, they don't like to see me coming in there at all, you know. And I pull in the driveway, and of course my car scrapes as I go across the driveway. <laughs> And I get in there, and I can see them through the window, and they're just having a ball with this whole deal. And I get in there, and I first thing I, you know, I want to be as cool as I can, and the first thing I do is I forget to put the rock down. And my car starts taking off, and I said, oh, I'll get it real slow, and it starts beating me. And so that was the first deal that happened. The second deal that happened, I went inside, inside, and nobody would wait on me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody. I kept walking around, I kept waiting, and nobody, and finally it, it was getting obvious, because I'd been there for 15 minutes, and I kept doing kind of like this as much as I could to get some kind of attention to me, and I, either they drew straws, or they got the rookie salesman to come out and wait on me, and they were all just having a ball with this deal, and finally this guy came out, and he says, uh, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I said, I, uh, I want an Eldorado. <laughs> and you would never believe how I said it. <laughs> and I said it real good. And uh, they told me, boy, you'd be assertive. And I said, yeah, I, I want an Eldorado, real arrogantly. And uh, he got real nervous because he could sense that this was a real deal. And he says, well, uh, well let, me get my, let, let me get my manager. And he went to get his manager. And out came Gil Wilson. Now, Gil Wilson and I have become real good friends since this, but Gil Wilson is the epitome of a Cadillac salesman, right? The black suit with the thin stripe, right? The little bitty skinny tie here. Black horn rim glasses with the gray temples. You know what I'm talking about. That's Gil Wilson, a real nice guy. And Gil Wilson came up to me and he says, uh, yes, uh, can I, can you help out with something here? Uh, uh, what can I do for you? And I said, uh, yeah, I want an Eldorado. 
And this was in 1968, and Eldorados had only came out in 67. There were very few Eldorados around, like only three. You can only get them, they're very rare to get. And so I had to have something that was different, so I wanted the Eldorado. And I said, so I'm an Eldorado. And he said, well, we don't have any Eldorados available. And I said, what about this green one? And there was a green Eldorado with a forest green with a kind of beige top. It was beautiful. It just really got me when I saw it. Because when I drove up, the sun was shining on it. And I mean, it was just gorgeous. And I said, so what's, what about that one? He said, oh, that one's sold. And I said, well, what's it doing here if it's sold? You know, and I couldn't even believe I did that, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm really getting on with it here today, feeling my oats. And, and so he says, well, the gentleman's supposed to come up and pick it up. It's a Friday. He said he's supposed to come up and pick it up on Monday. And I said, well, I need an Eldorado. And I said, I need it today. I said, I've got a very important business meeting I have to go to tonight. <laughs> and I need an Eldorado. <laughs> And he says, well, he says, I can't sell you that one today. He said, but if he doesn't pick it up, you can have it on Monday. And I said, Monday is, will not work at all. And uh, he said, listen, he said, I th he said, come with me. And he took me to the back, and they just had the truck deliver new cars. And there was a gold Eldorado on here. I don't know if you've seen the cars when they come off the trucks. They don't have hubcaps on them. You know, and they're real ugly. They got that stuff on them to protect them. It was a real ugly deal. I didn't like it at all. And I said, I don't like that one. He said, but you either got to take this one or you got to wait till Monday. And I said, okay. I said, let's go back and talk. And he took me back into his office, what I really call his, you know, the confession booth. You know, when you go in there to buy something, you got to confess all your sins before they let you buy it. And, and so he wrote down a few uh, figures on a piece of paper and he slid it over to me. Kind of let that one grab me. You know, and I looked at it and I says, I'll take it. And he couldn't believe it, right? And neither could I. <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, you have no idea what I was going to do there. I was having so much fun with it. I had no idea what the end result was going to be. And then uh, he says, okay. He says, uh, if that's acceptable to you, then we'll get going. I said, okay. I said, he said, let's get the paperwork going. I said, before you do the paperwork, I said, you got, I got to be assured that that car can be ready by 4.30 today. Can you get that car ready? Because if you can't, well, I got to know. He said, oh, I assure you, Mr. Thompson, he called me now. <laughs> he said, I assure you, Mr. Thompson, we can get that, that car ready. And I said, okay. So he went back and I said, hold it now. Can the papers be ready by 4.30? Because if not, I'm going down the, the, the road here to Smith Cadillac. And he said, I get your point. And we started writing. And I went home. I had about 45 minutes. And he was going to call me back to make sure everything was going to be taken clear of, got cleared on the whole thing. And I never thought it was going to happen. And he called me at 4 o'clock and he said, Mr. Thompson, come and get your car. And I let out a scream that you wouldn't even believe. And I smoked it back to Hayward, boy. And I got back there. I don't even remember how I got there. I got there. And, you know, I drove my car right up in front, right there. And I left it. I had my guy. I didn't make it. He didn't try to hide the rock. I just got out and put the rock down. <laughs> And I looked up, and I'm telling you, I looked up over here, and the sun is shining on this Cadillac, and it is, it looks good. I can't even believe how good this thing looks. It looks much better than, than the green one, maybe because I knew it was going to be mine. So we came in there, and I said, okay. I said, let's get on. I said, i got to get going on this thing. I was nervous that I was going to change my mind. I don't know what. I wanted to get out of there with my car. And uh, he said, well, it's going to take about 45 minutes. He said, there's one other client ahead of us here, and my, my girl's working on the paperwork. It's going to take about 45 minutes. And I said, I don't have 45 minutes. I said, can I just sign it, and you fill it out, and send me my copies? He said, well, of course we can. And then I said, okay, let me do that. And I'm really going for this thing. And I signed at the bottom, and I said, he could put any figures in there he wanted. And I said, well, that's all right. At least I'm going to have a Cadillac for 90 days. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> 90 days, I knew I was going to look real good. <laughs> so we did that, and we got out there. And now, by this time, this is the truth. Everybody in this whole agency is getting into this thing. The salesmen are into it. The mechanics keep coming out. They, some of them got their wives and a couple of girlfriends. They can't believe this deal is going on. And we go out there, and Gil Wilson is plenty excited about this whole thing. Now, he is really excited about it. And he's explaining everything to me, how it works and everything. And I said, listen, I haven't got time for that. I said, I just got to get going. He, and he said, well, listen, in the, in the glove box is the operator's manual. 
And he said, that explained everything to you. And I'm pushing every button. You can't believe it. The seat goes every which way. I mean, this is just really unbelievable to me, this Cadillac is. I mean, until you experience something like that, you never experience it. You'll never, you'll never understand that. And I'm pushing all the buttons and going back and forth, AM, FM, and I can even hear the dust on the needle on the station. I am my stereo, and I can just, I'm convinced of that. You know, and I, everything is perfect. And finally, I said, listen, I have got to go. And I started to drive out, and the baby's back in. And those of you that live up north, you know, it's a real long driveway out there. And I started to back up, and I, I started to drive off. I started that baby up. I adjusted the seat, got my mirror set on this one over here, got this mirror set, pulled the, still, the, the wheel down, brought it out, feels good. I said, this is it. And I started to leave. And as I started to leave, I said, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. And I buzzed up my power window. Okay? <laughs> and eased out of the parking lot. And just as I turn, I'm doing just two or three miles an hour, and I look up, and there's Mr. Wilson kind of trotting along the side of me like this. And I thought, God, hey, what a friendly salesman, you know? <laughs> like, get one of these deals. I get that baby up at about 10 miles an hour, and I can't believe it. I look up, and here's Mr. Wilson, you know, trotting alongside. And I look over, and I got the boy's tie caught in the window. I slam on my brakes, and he goes, whoop, <laughs> I buzz down the window and he does one of these, right? Unbelievable. True story. <laughs> True story. About a year later, I was living out in Oklahoma and I wanted my phone, I wanted to get another one. And I, and I called up Mr. Wilson and I told him I was going to tell him what I wanted and everything and I was going to have my folks drive it out. And I wasn't sure he was going to remember me at all when I called him. <laughs> but he certainly did. <laughs> so, I share that story with you for several reasons. Number one, uh, I enjoy telling it. Uh, as you can tell, but also let you know that uh, kind of give you an idea about where I've come from and what's happened to me and what has taken place. And to share with you, I think more importantly that if I can do something like this and make the significant changes in my life that I've made because of a few ideas that have been shared with me and because of a few people's concern and, and by having an opportunity at my disposal, I guess I'm trying to share with you that all of us in this room can do that too regardless because it really doesn't make any difference about our ages. It really doesn't make any difference about our business background or education level. What makes a difference is about how we feel about ourselves and our opportunity. And the things that I'm going to share with you today, for some of you that have been to some of our trainings before, there's going to not be a lot brand new here. There's going to be some new stuff. But right, yeah, there's a lot to be said for repetition, a whole lot to be said for that. And, and I'm just going to go over with you. So I, I just encourage you all to take real good notes. And we'll go over this, and hopefully we'll share it with you, and, and it'll have the impact on you that it's happened to a lot of us here. Uh, and it is, it is easy. I really like what Doug said here earlier. It's easier to make a lot of money and be successful than it is to make a living. It's difficult making a living. You understand? That's not an easy factor, making a living. It's an easier thing becoming successful. But it's not easier if you don't know a few things. You've got to be aware of, the, of those few key factors that make a difference. And I'm going to go over them with you. There's three parts to our herbal life business. Okay, and you need to master them all. Of course, the products. And we're not going to talk about the products. Mark is going to be doing a seminar uh, in about uh, four weeks that will be go completely over all the products with you. Okay? And you'll do it. You need to master the products. And you also need to master the second part of our business over here, which is the marketing part of our business, how the marketing opportunity works. Both of these are real simple. If you take an afternoon of two, three, four hours, you need to stack perfect. Let me move this back to this side over here. Does that help? You see it now? Is it okay for everybody over here? Is this in the way? No, okay. We'll get perfect. How's that? Bring this this way. We're in good shape. Okay? You guys got it over there? Uh, okay. You'll be able to take an afternoon of three or four hours and master the products in the marketing system. That's real simple. But th the third part of our business is the one that we're going to talk about today here. And this is the one that you need to work on. And that's the you part. That's the only variable in our, in our business. That's the only variable in any business. If, for those of you who are not part of Herbalife, I mean, if there's one person succeeding in Herbalife, then, and, and, and there's 99 not succeeding, okay, then we know that the products are working, we know that the marketing, the only variable is this right here. See, when I first discovered that, I always thought that a company should come out with a product that would cause everybody to make 5,000 a month. Because there's, what's the date here today? Is it 21st? 
21st. <clears throat> it's the 21st of the month right now, and there's people in this room that have already earned over 5000 this month. That's happened right here in this room. There's also people in this room that have earned only $500 this month. Now, it's the same 21 days, it's the same product, and it's the same marketing system. Okay, what causes one person to earn 10 times the amount of money than, this, than another person? What causes that? If it's not this, and it's not this, because those are identical. It's this right here is what causes. It's not 10 times the contacts. It's not 10 times the time. It's not 10 times the experience. That is not the factor. If that was a factor, I wouldn't be here today. Mark Hughes wouldn't be here today. Doug Stutz wouldn't be doing what he's doing today. You understand? Because we didn't have those things. We didn't have them. It's this here. It's how you feel about the products, how you feel about the marketing, but most importantly, how you feel about your own personal financial future, how you feel about you. You got involved in herbal life because you were looking for something to change in your life. See, are you, whatever, you, you, different reasons, obviously, all of us have different reasons for becoming involved in, in the company. <clears throat> but we're all looking for something to change and improve. Well, I'll give you a formula here, a real easy formula that we use. For things to change, you've got to change. For things to get better, you've got to get better. I'll tell you what the rest of 1981 is going to be like exactly like the first part of 1981, unless you do something different. Now that's not only talking financially. We're going to use financial here today because that's a measuring stick. Everything else is debatable. But in, money is only important to measure how well you're doing, how well your principles and philosophies and willingness and desire and attitude are in fact holding up is by how much value that you can create here. Okay? And so, um, uh, you know, somebody earns 5000 somebody earns 500 You know, there's 10 times difference here. But when we're talking about becoming successful for things to change, you've got to change. We're talking about in all areas of your life, not just money. If you don't like the way your personal life is going, I'll tell you what it's going to look like the rest of 1981. The first, just like the first part. It's going to. If you don't like the way your spiritual life is going, it's going to be just like it was. If you don't like the way your family life is going, it's going to be just like it was. Okay? It's not going to change. For things to get better, you've got to get better. For things to change, you've got to change. Okay? There's a very simple formula. Everybody I've ever met in my life, almost everybody I've ever met in my life, wants to have an above average income. To have an above average income, it's very simple. You've got to be willing to become an above average person. You've got to be willing to have an above average attitude, above average handshake, above average desire, above average willingness, above average excitement. You got to be above average, and you get an above average income. You never met anybody with an above average income that isn't above average. See, you got to be willing to become average, above average. You got to be willing to spend more time on you than on your job. You got to be willing to spend more time working on you than on your products. You got to be spending willing to spend more time on your marketing than uh, on your on you than on your marketing. You got to be willing to do that sort of thing. Because that's the real factor here. And I'm going to go through here and I'm going to talk with you. The first part we're going to do here is talk to you about the concepts of how to build up an organization. Okay? As a matter of fact, I'm just going to um, right here, how to build up an organization. Try to give you some notes. How to build an organization. Now, I'm going to do a lot of abbreviating here today. But you'll get it down. Now, how to build an organization, the same things apply on how to make a retail sale. The same things would apply no matter what you do. If you get the concepts down, they apply to everything. The first thing, if you're going to build an organization, you've got to know what type of people to look for. Who to look for. Let's, use, let's call it that. Who to look for. Who do we want to look for? <clears throat> we have a lot of school teachers in urban life. And uh, a lot of people say, boy, I better go get me some school teachers, right? Well, I have a lot of doctors in their life. Got to go get some doctors. I have a lot of professional people. We've got uh, construction workers, accountants. We've got all types of people here. People go, what type of people do I look for? What type of people am I going for? I'm going to give you a common denominator that we all have here in the room. And the common denominator that all of us have, it has nothing to do with, with our backgrounds at all. It has nothing to do with our experiences. There's one thing that we have in common in this room. And this is the type of person you're looking for. We're looking for dissatisfied people. 
dissatisfied. And you say, that sounds a little strange, right? Dissatisfied. That's right. That's what, we're, that's what we've got in common. All of us in this room were dissatisfied with something. We came to Herbal Life hoping that Herbal Life would change that for us. And I'm going to give you some categories here that we're going to go with. And uh, I encourage you to take a lot of good notes to it with it here. Uh, personally, okay? Let's talk about, let's have some categories. So we're looking for dissatisfied people, but let's get some categories going. Of course, money, right? Show me someone that's dissatisfied with their income, and I'll show you somebody that you need to be talking to Herbalife about, okay? There's two parts to recruiting, and you need to separate these two parts. And that's what we do, we recruit. Make no mistake about it, we recruit. Don't you ever shy away from that word. The most successful organization, the only successful organizations in this country are the biggest recruiters in the world. Some of you in this room have got the different colleges and universities and institutions that have gone out there, IBM, General Motors, and Xeroxes, all the major corporations send their recruiters out to get the most talented people that they can to go to work for their organizations. Right? That's what we do also. We send you out to get the most talented people that you could find. And one thing that we're looking for besides dissatisfaction in an individual, we're looking for one key factor also, and that's called a nice person. You ever notice that about over life? You've got to be a nice person. If you're not a nice person, people that aren't really nice people, they're real arrogant, so they generally don't last long here because they just don't fit around our group of people. They're not a nice people here. It really never matters to me when someone comes and looks at our business or our product line if they become a part of us. What makes a difference to me is when they leave, they say, I'll tell you one thing, those Herbalife people are nice people. I like them. And that's the kind of feeling that I want to get going. I know that's the kind of feeling that you want. That's what we have. But don't shy away. One part of recruiting, okay, two parts to it, as we said earlier. One part is going out there and prospecting. Prospecting is the formal term in the industry. That's just finding somebody to talk to is all that is. The second part is inviting them. Or, what would that be called? Talking to them, right? So if you were going to sell the product, the first thing you'd need to do is prospect, so you'd need to find someone to talk to about your products, right? And then you'd need to do what? Then talk to them. Two separate issues, two separate entities. So we're looking for dissatisfied people. The first thing we've got to do is find somebody that, that we sense is dissatisfied, and then we're going to talk to them, okay? But what could they be dissatisfied with? How about income, okay? I would say that that's, the most, that's initially probably 60 or 70 percent of the people in our company come to look at Herbalife because of this, right? And we, we have people making a lot of money in here. Doug Stutz stood up here and he told you, which is a fact, that he made more last month than he earned in a whole year teaching school. Now that's a phenomenal success story, right? Yeah. It's a very big one. But uh, when you take in consideration it's been less than a year that it's taken him to learn the talents to be able to do that, that is really phenomenal. And that's the kind of thing that we need to pay attention to. We don't have to accept things the way they are. See, there's only been about a half a dozen things that I've ever learned in my life that's made the majority of the difference in my life. Not just from income, I'm talking about personally. Half a dozen things have made 80% of, of, of the difference. See, the nice thing is you can have more than you, than you have now, you can only have what you are, right? But you can have more than what you are because you can become more than what you are right now. That's what's exciting about the things that we're going to share with you here tonight. And don't ever, get, don't ever let people tell you that there's no opportunity left. There's plenty of opportunity. In 1950, there were 16,000 millionaires in this country. There's over 600,000 millionaires in this country today. Right now. So don't you buy this no opportunity story. Don't you buy this you better get something safe and secure story. You don't want to go for that story at all because that's all you're going to get is that one. Go for an opportunity. And of the 600,000 millionaires, of all the millionaires going to be created this year, this is the first year that more than half of them are going to be women. Well, I guess what I'm saying is there's something for everybody here. Something for everybody. So, we, but when we're talking about income here, we don't need to be talking about those kind of incomes. Listen, when you start making five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month, you know, you don't need to be talking about that kind of money. Let me tell you what most what was exciting to most people. If you show, if you'd have showed me a way before I got started in in the direct sales field, if you'd have showed me a way that I'd have had. Four or five hundred dollars, three hundred dollars left over at the end of the month, free and clear. 
I would have been completely satisfied. Because I liked my job. I enjoyed the people I worked with. I was happy there. The only thing that I wasn't pleased with was my income. And it never occurred to me that I could change it. You know that? It never dawned on me, and that is the truth, that I could do something about it. I didn't know that I could. I thought that that's the way it was, because everybody I knew was that way. They always, you know, everybody always has just enough money to get by. They do. And uh, listen, I'm not making money out like it's everything, because money's not everything, unless you don't have enough. <laughs> you think about that for a minute. What happens when you don't have enough? What does money become? Everything. Every so we need to face the facts here today. We need to tell ourselves the truth. But let me tell you what to get a lot of people excited. Three, four, five hundred dollars a month. When March is over, if you've got four hundred dollars left in your bank account to do with as you please, to buy clothes, to go out someplace, to go away on a trip, to spend on your home, to give to somebody, whatever you want to do with it, free and clear to do with as you please at the end of this month, that would be something for the majority of people in this country. It would be. Okay? And now have it at the end of April. And now have it at the end of May. And now have that at the end of June. You understand? That's a lot of money. If a person has $100 free and clear left over now at the end of each month, if they have that, and now they've got 400 they don't have an additional 300 They've got three times the lifestyle. You understand? Three times the amount of entertainment you can go through. Three times the quality of vacations. Three times the quality of everything that you do that's extra. It's three times. See? That's very important here that we understand that in three or four hundred dollars is a lot of money. So you don't need to be talking about fortunes to everybody. We need to understand that just a few hundred dollars extra is a lot. That doesn't mean that people aren't making large sums. They are. But we need to pay attention to that. So if you show me someone that's dissatisfied with their income, that's somebody that you need to put down and, and be talking to. So dissatisfaction. Here's another area. Career. Some people might be satisfied with their income, but they're dissatisfied with their career. It's very hard today to find people that are not interested in a real career. Okay, not a you know not one that's written down on a piece of paper. Okay, not one that that current companies or corporations talk about, but a real career where someone can sink their teeth in and do something with it. Careers are very important here. Uh, matter of fact, I tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to separate the men and the women here in two different groups, just for an illustration here. And, uh, and I'd like to talk about the women first. Let's, there's very few women today that you can meet that aren't interested in doing, having some kind of career. Do you agree with that? Almost all of them. There's women today during their late 30s, early 40s that have never worked before. Never, ever worked before. Never had a job. Never had any, quote, unquote, professional skills to go out and create a job with and create a career with. But they now feel like they need to go out there and do something for their own identity, whatever reasons. It's, it's, we know that. We don't have to talk about that. That's what's happening. But where do they go? Where does the American woman go today to create a new career? Where's the first spot she go? I'll tell you, she's got a couple options. The local coffee shop. Right? Or the local office. Right? Where is she going to go that she can legitimately create a career? Not interfere with her family she has one. Not interfere with it. Where can she go? There's very little offered to her. Here in urban life, listen, careers for women are not something that lip service is given to. Our top distributor in the company is Jerry, right? Used to teach school and used to be a checker at check market basket. There's not, there's not two marketing systems here. We don't say that if you're a man and when you become a supervisor you get 50%, but if you're a woman you get 48%. Do we? We don't say that men have to do 4,000 in one month to move up, but women have to do 4,200. We don't have any of that deal, do we? We don't say if you're a man on your royalty override bonuses you get 5% if you're a woman you only get 4.5%. See, it's an equal deal here. It's equal is as equal does. See, we've got a chance for a, for a woman to step up here and create a career of her own if she wants to. I'll use my sister as a good example. My sister was looking for a career. My sister got started in herbal life in December of last year with a kit. And in December last year, she took that kit and she earned five hundred and sixty dollars part time. She didn't. She moved, she was living in a brand new state, only been there a few months. She didn't know anybody at all. 
But she got started, she was excited about the products, she lost 10 pounds on them, and she started telling people about the products, and she made $560 part-time in December. In January, she made $2,973. In February, she earned over $4,500. Her royalty bonus alone was $2,010, her third month in the business. Now, my sister didn't think that that was possible to have that kind of career. If you tell that kind of story to the majority of people, they don't believe it. I'll tell you who doesn't believe it. Most of all, my sister doesn't believe it. <laughs> you know, she used to drive a truck. <laughs> it's the truth. She was a truck driver. She's loving this whole thing. Boy, she's sitting back there. She's got a few silk shirts, right? She's real skinny. Got a few hundred dollars in her pocket. She's looking real good. You know, you single guys in this room ought to pay real close attention. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> She's doing real good. Okay, so I'm saying that a person can start right where they are and go wherever they want to go. Let's talk about men. Put them in a separate category. Most men want a career. They do. They get going out there and all of a sudden, most men find themselves, I never would have got out of construction work if that were why. The story I would have told you wouldn't happen. I know I'd still be there and never know the difference. Okay? I'd have been happy because I wouldn't have known the difference. I wouldn't be unhappy knowing the difference of being back there, but I wouldn't have been any less unhappy. I wouldn't. Okay? It would have been the same. But now that I know the difference, it's a world of difference. You understand? When you have choices, knowing things, becoming aware of things only gives you choices to go with. Gives you more options for you to exercise. I wish we had the ability to get 50 men in a room. Okay? And I'd like these 50 men to have one thing in common. I'd like them to have age in common. And I'd like them to be about 35 years old. And I'd like to ask these 50 men one question. So you're 35 now, gentlemen. In another 30 years, you're going to be 65, and you're going to be retiring. Our question to you is this. Do you want to be doing the same thing that you're doing now for another 30 years? If they were to answer us truthfully, what do you think the majority of them would say? No. But if we had the ability to follow them until they were 65, what do you think would happen? We'd find out that the majority of them were doing exactly what they were doing at age 35. Question, how come? How come a person would do something for 30 years that they don't want to do? Security. Answer is, little of choice. You take a 35-year-old man, he generally has a family, generally has his lifestyle cocked up to a certain level here, right? He can't, he doesn't want to take a chance to jeopardize what he's got to start something brand new, even though he knows he wants another career. And he says, I won't be doing this till I'm 65, but 66, I mean 36, 37, 38, and before he knows it, he's 62, 63, 64, 65, and he's doing it, and he had no intentions of it. But you see, and he gets about 60, 61, 62, you know what he says? Well, it hasn't been the best job in the world, but I'll tell you right now, it's certainly provided a lot of security from a family. Good hospitalization, good retirement. Right? You know what that's called? Justification. He's justifying to himself and to his family why he did something for 30 years he didn't want to do. Now, I'm not putting that down. Don't misunderstand that at all. I'm saying he's got to justify because if he can't justify it, you go to the local bridge and he's got to jump. See, that's what happens when a guy, you know, takes it, he buys his own ticket, right? That's the end of the day. He can't justify it anymore. End the deal. Right? So they've got to justify But I'm also saying this. You take that person at 35 and you give him an opportunity that he can work at his own pace. He doesn't have to jeopardize his job. He doesn't have to jeopardize his family. He can go at his own pace, his own rate, find his own space. And I tell you what you better do with that man. If he believes in what he's doing and believes in himself enough to try, I'm telling you, you better get out of his way because he'll take advantage of it. So when we're looking for dissatisfied people, I need you to understand the issue here. It's not just money at all. Not, not whatsoever. Let's talk about another area here. It's called challenge. Some people are just flat bored. Some people make a decent income. Some people got a decent career, but they're bored. Challenge is a terrible deal to have. There's nothing that does it for the human spirit like the thrill of challenge. When a person's challenged, they walk different, they talk different, they act different. You get up in the morning different. Everything is different. The way you talk to your, to your, to your lady, the way you talk to your men, the way you talk to your children, the way you talk to your employees and to, and to your co-workers is different. You understand? When you've got a challenge in front of you. 
You have a challenge in front of you. It doesn't make any difference about if it's cold or it's rainy. It doesn't make any difference if it's hot. It doesn't make any difference if your tire blew out on the freeway. If you've got a challenge, you've got something more important in front of you. More important than coming home and, you know, turning on, eating a little bit and turning on the television and going to sleep at 10 o'clock every night. There's something more important than that. Okay? Sometimes money and career, but it's bored. A person's got to be, you know, can get real bored over here. Here's another one. This is important. This is called fun. Show me someone that's dissatisfied with the fun in their life. Let me tell you, fun is really something. Uh, I mean, that's a, I, it's hard for me to, uh, you know, it's, people enjoy fun, right? I mean, fun is something. You can't even say the word fun without smiling. Try it. Say fun, right? <laughs> you can smile when you say fun. You can't say fun. It won't even come out. You can't even get it out of your mouth, right? It doesn't happen. I mean, everybody enjoys having fun. They do. But there's things, you know, you've got, you know, <laughs> you've been, we've all been in this situation before, right? Where there's going to be a big party coming up in three weeks. I'm telling you, in three weeks, boy, are we going to have some fun in three weeks. What happened to this time in between? I mean, are we only reserved for fun in three weeks at this party? Is that the only time we can have fun? Or can we have fun going to work? Can we have fun taking rejection? Can we have fun with disappointment? <laughs> See? Can we do that deal? I mean, listen, fun, if fun is such a good deal, it seems like we should be able to capitalize on it as much as we, we, we can. Doesn't that, doesn't that make sense to you? So, you know, the party deal. Three weeks, we're going to have fun. Right? It goes to two weeks, now we're going to have fun at this party. One week, oh boy, one more week and we're going to have a ball. Saturday night comes around, it's a big bummer. Right? <laughs> you can't just say, okay, it's 8 o'clock Saturday night, three weeks later, and now we're going to have some fun. It doesn't work that way. Right? Fun is either part of your life or it's not a part of your life. What causes people to not have fun? Lack of money, lack of career, lack of challenge. You've got these things going, you're going to have fun. No matter what happens to you, you're going to have fun. Because you now have the capacity for life. You've got the capacity to have fun. You can only have as much fun as you have the capacity to enjoy it. See? You're only going to have as much fun as you're entitled to have according to your personal growth and your personal awareness. That's the only amount of fun that you can have. That's sustaining. So you show me someone that's dissatisfied, and I'll show you someone that you need to put down on your list. So you get, a, get the idea of what we're looking for? If you're going to build an organization, you want to know who to look for? Dissatisfied people. Now, you can come up with a lot more categories than I've got here, can't you? I mean, just go to work with dissatisfied. Now, if you find someone that's completely satisfied, you don't want to invite them at all, right? Uh, it'd be a waste of time. But if you find someone like that, would you do me a favor, take a picture of them and get a description so we can pass around so you find one like this, don't invite them, right? They're completely satisfied. Uh, but I don't think you're going to find them too well. Okay, who to look for? Now, we got that one done. The next thing we want to do here is we want to put together a list of names. We're going to call this one A up here, and we'll call this one B down here. List of names. Now, we're going to put together a list of names of who? Dissatisfied people. We're going to call this one A up here, and we'll call this one B down here. List of names. Now, we're going to put together a list of names of who? Dissatisfied people. Now, you're not going to think... Well, let me give you some categories here. Let's break this list up into categories because I want all of you, if you're going to be developing up an organization, you're going to need a list to go from. If you're going to be developing up customers, you're going to need a list to go from. Okay? Here's the list. How about friends? Okay? Make a list of the friends that you have that you feel might be dissatisfied with one of these areas. The issue here is not if they want to become part of verbal life. The issue here is not if they'd like to be a supervisor or consultant. The issue here is not if they'd like to be involved in the nutritional industry. That's not the issue. What's the issue? If they're dissatisfied, they go on the list. That's the issue. You say, well, I don't think they're going to want to do it because they don't have any time. That's not the issue here. Right? The issue is if you feel like you're dissatisfied, they go on the list. Now. 
Let's put another one down here. How about relatives? Okay, how many relatives do you have that you feel might be dissatisfied with one or more areas of their life? Put them down. How about neighbors? How about coworkers? How about clubs, organizations? How about your church group? You know, how about old high school or college? Uh, how about fraternities? How about anything? You know, just start to think here. If you think you're going to be here and go over here, if you think you're going to go from $800 a month to $9,000 plus a month, okay, if you think that's going to happen here, then, and if it's going to happen just like right now without some work and effort, that's not going to take place. We've got the products and we got the marketing and we'll teach you a few things that you need to go to work on, but you're going to have to take the responsibility for your financial future. You got to take the responsibility for where you are, and you got to take the responsibility for where you aren't. You understand? And you got to accept both of those cases for to, before you can move forward. Okay? Friends, relatives, neighbors, coworkers. Now let me share something with you about this one here. I had people say, "Oh, I don't want to. I don't. Wanna, I don't want to recruit my friends. Or I don't want to sell to my friends. I feel funny making money off my friends." How many of you've ever heard that statement? Right? I've heard it. Heard it a lot. I used to say, okay, then let's go this direction over here. Because I didn't, I didn't understand it. But now that I understand it, I got to make a point here. They can do what they want to, but they need to understand what the issue is. Let's say that you ladies had a dress shop. And one of your friends came in to, to visit you. You hadn't seen her for a while. She came in, you're all excited, and you're talking and catching up, and all the little gossip and everything's going on, getting everybody caught up again. And then she says, i got to buy a dress here. That's the real reason I came in here. And she goes over here, and on the hanger she sees... The perfect dress for her. Right color, right cut, right collar, everything is right. She tries it on, it takes five years off her age. She looks at the price tag, she can't believe it. She says, I'll take it. And you, as the owner of the shop, say, listen, Mary, I wish that you'd go down the street and buy it at Bullock's. And she said, I'm confused, why would I go down there and buy it? Is it less down there? She said, no, matter of fact, it probably costs a little more down there than here. I said, well, why am I going down there? I said, I feel real funny, Mary, making money off my friends. <laughs> now, if she has that dress shop, and if she's invested her time and energy and money into that dress shop, is she entitled to make a profit off of anybody that walks in there that wants those goods? The answer is yes. The only way you're entitled to make a profit is if you provide goods or services. And then it's immoral if you provide goods or services and don't make a profit from it. And I'll tell you who expects you to make a profit on it. Everybody who walks in your dress shop expects you to. You're entitled to make a profit here. You need to get your thinking straight here. You've got the finest quality products in the world to share with people. The finest quality products. And if you're hesitant to share them with your friends and relatives, and neighbors and co-workers, then you need to evaluate you, not the products and the opportunity. You need to evaluate your thinking. See? Get the issue here work along. If you're hesitant to talk to friends, relatives, neighbors, and co-workers about the opportunity, then that is not... That's, you need to face the real issue here. You need to take a look at your thinking here and get it straight. Now, it's not important. If you still feel like that after you do it, then do it any way you can. You understand? If, if you still, I still don't want to talk, then go talk, go put flyers out, run ads, do any, talk to strangers on the street, knock people down, do anything you got to do, right? But you need to think about this one here, okay? So you get your list made. Does this make sense to you here? Get a list made, put together for 100 people. Say, I don't know 100 people. Of course you know 100 people. If you divide it into categories, you can't come up with 10 people. If you think, well, I don't want to put John down because... He doesn't have experience for this. And, oh, no, I don't want to put Uncle Joe. No, 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 no. Not him. Uh -uh, he didn't have the time for this deal at all. Right? You see what I mean? If you start doing that, you can't come up with ten names. Your, your job here is not to think if it would be for them. Your job is not to think if they'd like it. Your not, job is not to think if they wouldn't like it. Your job is, if you think you're dissatisfied, here, remember two parts, finding someone to talk to? What's the second part? Talking to them. Your job is to talk to them. If they don't want, if they ain't got the time, that's up to them. They don't want, they don't want to come down. That's up to them. Okay? See what I'm saying? Okay. Now, we've got who to look for. Dissatisfied people. We put them in a list of names. Now, the next thing we've got to do is we've got to 
before we talk to anybody, is we've got to get our attitude straight. We're going to call this C. Get your attitude straight. There's three areas to your attitude that you need to go to work on before you talk to anybody. And we all go through periods of time, me included, when you go to talk to somebody and your attitude is not quite the way you'd like it to be, right? You're just not quite as positive, you're not quite this, you're not quite that. Answer is, don't talk to them until <laughs> you get your attitude straight. That's all. They're simple. Don't go out there and, and deliberately set yourself up for a fall. Don't do that deal. Don't go out there deliberately say, there's no need to call him. He's not going to want to do it. Uh, you're right. Save a phone call, <laughs> right? Because we communicate with feelings. We don't communicate with words. How many are afraid of dogs? we got a lot of liars in here. I know there's more people afraid of dogs in here than this, okay? But though, I used to be afraid of dogs. I really did. I am not afraid of dogs anymore. And I'll tell you, I got it down coming to a few training classes. That's true. Because animals communicate with feelings, not with words. And those of you, I want you to picture this. I want you to picture a house that's set back off the street a little bit with a little picket fence about this high with a long sidewalk like the old houses used to have, right? Like where and you walk right up that little sidewalk and there's the front door. You've got to go in there. But on the gate, a sign says, Beware of vicious dog. It doesn't say beware of dog. It doesn't say beware of bad dog. It says vicious dog. And you know, that's a whole different deal there. You know, it makes you look at that twice. But you've got to go up. And you say, okay. And as soon as you get there, the dog runs up. And he's giving you his teeth and his snarls and his garls. He's doing all that stuff. You say, i got to go. I'm not afraid of you, dog. Oh, what a nice, pretty dog you are. And you start to go in there, and you're afraid of him. What's going to happen? It's going to get you. Right? That's what's going to happen. But as soon as you smoke it back outside the fence, here comes this little four-year-old girl. She's never seen that dog before at all. And she decides she's going to walk up that same sidewalk you do. And as she walks up there, the dog licks her heels all the way up. Same vicious dog. How come? Because the dog can feel it. Right? And it can't be. So can people. Have you ever talked to someone where no matter what they said, you just sensed that they were lying to you? Right? That's communicating with feelings. Right? Have you, you sense something's not right, regardless of maybe it's not even lying. Right? Maybe you just sense something's not quite right because we communicate with feelings. That's the same thing when you go to talk to people about your herbal life products, your herbal life opportunity. You need to get your thinking straight. First, or they're going to pick it up. They're going to pick it up. I had a lady come to me once and said, I need some help. And I said, I'll do anything I can to help you. She said, I can't get anybody at all to look at this opportunity. And I said, you're absolutely right. I said, what else can I help you with? And she said, oh, you, you, didn't, you didn't understand me. I can't get any, you know, I don't get anybody to look. I talked to this for blah, 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 blah. And she went on and gave me the whole list of how many people she talked to that day, 27, and da, 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 and all this. And she said, and I can't get anybody to look. And I said, I, I, I agree with you. I said, is there anything else I can help you with? She says, are you making fun of me? And I said, I'm not making fun of you at all. I said, you just told me you couldn't get them to look. I said, we don't have anything else to discuss about that. You're right. You don't, can't get them to look at all. I said, can, can I help you with another project? Right? Because as long as she's thinking that way, what is she doing when she picks up the phone? She's communicating it to them because just like the dog. Right? She's going to show her the products that I don't think they're going to want to buy. They're not going to want to buy. She's right. Right? She's right. This thing is not fallible. I'm not telling you anything here that you don't already know. There's going to be very little stuff that I'm going to share with you today that you don't already know. It might give it another viewpoint, but it's going to be very little that you don't already know. Here's the attitude you've got to have before you talk to anyone about the herbal life opportunity. You need the gold mine attitude. That's what you need, the gold mine attitude. And I'm going to share a story with you here, and I want you to kind of go with me on this story. And I want you to get into this story. If I tell, I talk to you about the wind blowing, I want you to feel the wind blowing in your face here, okay? I'll tell you a perfect time for this story, a Sunday morning. That's the best. Sunday mornings are different. You ever notice that Sundays have a different feeling than Mondays and Saturdays and Fridays? Sundays are different. Every day of the week has a different... You can tell. If you didn't know, you could almost tell what day of week it was by just seeing a few people and watching and stuff. Sundays are special. And I want you to think about perhaps waking up real early. I know we've all experienced this sometime, even if we don't like to wake up early. 
But I want you to think about waking up real early in the morning. Maybe 5.30. For some reason, you have no idea what, you can't believe you're awake, and you look at your clock, and it's 5.30, you can't believe this for a minute, right? But you feel so alive, so alert, instantly you're on just like that, and you can't believe it. The sun is shining outside, you can see it. And you get dressed, and you go out there, and you start to make yourself some orange juice or something. You're just, you can't, everybody in the house is asleep, and you're real quiet, and you're kind of glad you're asleep, because you're enjoying this so much. You decide to walk outside. And there's just that slight chill in the air, but it's gonna, going to be warm, and you can tell it. Birds are chirping, right? You can hear them. There's hardly any traffic. It's one of the clearest days that you've seen in a long, long time. And you're just enjoying it. And you decide that, heck, I'm going to go for a drive. I'm going to head up in the mountains. And you get in your car, and you start driving up in the mountains. And you got your window out, the, or out the, your arm out the window. And wind's blowing in. It just feels so refreshing. You get out to the foothills, driving around, and finally, all of a sudden, you start driving on one of your favorite roads. Just a few houses on it, driving around. And you look up, and there's a road off to the right that you've seen before, and you've thought about before, but today, you're going to see where that road goes. And you start driving up this road, and every now and then, you can start catching a glimpse of the valley down here. And then, the road comes up here, and there, you can see that there hasn't been anybody dry, driven up here in, a, in years, because there's no, there's all grass over the road. And you get up on a little flat plateau there, and you park your car, and you lean out, you lean against your car, and you're looking at one of the most magnificent views that you've ever seen in your life. And you can't believe that something this beautiful exists. As you're standing there, enjoying it all, you look over here to the right, there's something over here that's different. You're not quite sure what it is, but you decide to go investigate. And the closer you get to it, the more intriguing it becomes. And if you get a few feet away, your suspicions are confirmed here. It looks like it's the mouth of a cave that's been covered up with brush. So you start quickly pulling all the brush off, and you get it all, and it's a big cave. And it kind of goes for like 10 feet and then turns to the right just a little bit. And the sun is shining right in on it. And it looks like it's a safe cave, so you decide to venture in. You're real nervous. And you start walking in, and you don't have no idea what's to the right. And as soon as you get there, and you look to the right, what do you think you see? Gold coins from floor to ceiling, wall to wall. Gold coins. No telling how long they've been there. After you bite one to make sure it's real, Next thing I'd do is look over my shoulder, make sure no one's following me, right? I get my, then I'm going to get my car as close as I can. I guarantee you, when I go home, it's going to be so loaded. If it was dark, the headlights would be in the trees, right? That's when it's going to be loaded. Now you get back, and when you get back home, right? Now your wife is awake, and she says, where have you been? It's 1030. I've been worried, I've been worried to death about you. He says, open the garage door quick. Right? She gets the garage door open and you pull the car and she said, where'd you get this? He said, I don't have time. Help me unload it. And she certainly does. Okay? <laughs> Loads that baby into the basement and you says, I'll be back. And this time you go get a pickup truck and a U-Haul trailer. <laughs> You're going to need a shovel. Right? And you stop by the local hardware store, you don't even go down to pick and save to get it at 40% off. No, no. You go to the local hardware store, pull it, pay full retail. Right? You shovel. You get out there and you load that baby up and you can't even believe your good fortune. You go and unload that one. You come back for a third load. But when you come back for your third load, something's not quite right. You're not sure what it is. So when you leave, you take a stick and you just put a mark on the ground. And when you come back for your fourth load, you've got the answer. What you were thinking all along is true. There's more gold now than when you started. You discover every coin you take out, two coins comes in its place. And the first thing you do is get very excited. The second thing you do is realize you've got to have some help, right? Or it's going to be out the mouth of the cave and the whole world's going to know about it. So you've got to get some help. So who's the first person you want to help you? 
Are you going to run an ad? Are you going to go to the local unemployment office? Are you going to run some flyers at the shopping center? You know? What are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to get my brother Johnny. Right? i got to go over and get him. He's got to help me load this gold up, right? Now I go over to him, and he's watching the Super Bowl. Right? It's the last minute and a half of the, of the first half. Right? It's tied. They're going for the score. And I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to wait for it to get over. Or am I going to turn the television off and say, listen to this? Right? What's more important, right? See? That's the gold mine attitude. I don't know if there's a gold mine like that that exists in this country. But I'll tell you what, I, I would not trade. I would not trade what I've got in Herbalife for a gold mine like that. I wouldn't do it. See, that's what Herbalife's got the vault door open. Is it? And we're saying, come and take all the gold you want. You can take it all. Everything you want. Come on in. You need some help? Get some helpers. You can come and get it. Need some more? Get some more helpers. Yeah, have them get a couple. Come and get all you want. Just don't push, don't shove, and don't be greedy. And the more gold that we take out, the more gold there is for everybody. There's more gold in the herbal life cave now than there was a year ago. And the more people that come to the, the cave and take out the gold, the more gold there is for everybody else. Now that's the attitude you need when you share this opportunity with people. You need the gold mine attitude. Okay? Now, you also, here's the second thing you need to do. You need to get excited and enthusiastic. And if you've got a gold mine, you have no problem getting excited and enthusiastic. None whatsoever. And I'll tell you what, if you went over to your brother Johnny's house and he said, come with me and dig the gold, yeah, no, I want to finish the game. You would say, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. Oh, no, nobody wants to help me dig the gold. I'm going to go back home. <laughs> nobody wants help. You know, you'll call up your wife and say, nobody wants to go with me. This is not for me. You know, I've got to dig all this gold by myself. How many people am I going to talk to? It doesn't work like that, deal, Right? You go tell her that. You know what she's going to tell you. Hit it. Right? Get somebody now. Right? Or you stay here. I'll go get the gold. Uh, I know what she'd say to you. So you've got to be excited and enthusiastic about this whole thing. Now I'm talking about genuine excitement. I'm not talking about phony excitement. I'm talking about real, sincere excitement is what you've got to have. You know, you can come to one of these meetings and you get excited. You go to one of our meetings and any of our offices, and it, 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 it's hard to even talk to a customer and not get excited. People can get you excited real easy about this. Things can get you excited, right? But I'm talking about real, sincere, deep excitement that comes from within. And the only way I know to get that is with the facts. That's the only way I know to get it. If you've been out to that gold mine, if you've seen it, and you've been into it, and you've seen that every coin you take out, two more comes back in, and someone says, I'm not going to go with you, you're not going to feel bad at all. You know better. And that's the same thing here. People are going to, the phrase is, rain on your parade. You bet your life they are. People are going to tell you they're crazy. You're crazy. People say, oh, no, another one of those deals. Right? Oh, no, oh, no. They're going to pull that deal on you. It makes no difference what they do. It makes a difference what you do. I'm telling you right now, you can go out there. And you can talk to people. And the most important thing that I can share with you today, the most important thing that I can share with you today, is it makes no difference of who you, the people you talk to if they buy your story. What makes a difference is if you buy their story. They're going to dump on you. They're going to tell you how bad your products are. They're going to tell you how bad your opportunity is. They're going to tell you how foolish you are. They're entitled to say what they want to. You're entitled to believe what you want to. Well, the greatest stories of all, the greatest teacher of all, some 2,000 years ago, had to develop up his organization, right? He had his, not top 10, but his 12, that he spent three years training and teaching. And finally the time came, and you know what the story is, the, story, the time came for him to send them out into the cities, and they were going to go out in the cities two by two. Remember the story? And they were all excited. They were jazzed up. They were excited. They are going to go out and they were going to tell this story to everybody. They were going to convert the whole world over to their story. The greatest teacher of all saw that there was something there. And he said, before you go, fellas, there's one thing I need to share with you. When you go out into those cities, every home is not going to be of your accord. And when you leave the home, shake every grain of sand from your shoes. Now, 
I thought about that one for a long time. What does that mean? Shake every grain of sand from your shoes. I think I understand it. If you have a grain of sand in your shoe, one grain of sand won't necessarily hurt you. Unless it stays there over a prolonged period of time and it will start a little irritation. Matter of fact, you can probably leave one grain of sand in your shoe for some time and never shake it out. But if you've got two grains of sand in your shoe, now it's a little bit uncomfortable and you need it to give it some attention. And if you leave it there, it becomes increasingly more of a hindrance. And if you get three grains of sand in your shoe and you don't do anything about it, the next thing you know, you have a blister. And if you don't take any, pay any attention to it then, the next thing you know, it's infected. The next thing you know, you have to have your foot amputated and it could kill you. Is that the truth? From one grain of sand. Remember, it was important enough for him to mention just before they left. And you know what that means to me? When you go out there, every home's not going to be of your accord. They're not. And what that means is it makes no difference if they buy your story. What makes a difference is when you leave them that you don't buy any part of their story. And the reason you're not going to do that is because you got the facts. You got the facts. And you got the facts. And, you're, and so your excitement and your enthusiasm is genuine. Genuine excitement. Genuine enthusiasm. Don't let anybody sell you their bill of goods at all. If you do, you deserve what you get. Period. Over and out. You deserve it. See, remember this one here. If it's not sincere, it'll get you. You can come to meetings, as I said earlier, and you can get excited. You can. You can do it. I, I, you can read a book and get excited. You can listen to a tape and get excited. If there's one book that you can read in Los Angeles, I'm telling you, there's a thousand books you can read in Los Angeles that teach you how to be more excited and more enthusiastic. If there's one course you can take from $25 to $2,500, there's got to be a hundred courses you can take that will teach you how to be more excited and more enthusiastic. Right? They teach you things that you won't even, you, you would believe it because you've gone through them too. They teach you things like this. When you wake up in the morning, one of the first things you want to do is you want to yell as loud as you can, beat yourself on the chest, and run to the bathroom. <laughs> they claim you got to go anyway, so you might as well run. Right? Heck, I tried that. I got it. I felt foolish. I didn't have to go. <laughs> you know? There's others that teach you that if you feel a little introverted and you need some excitement to wear red underwear. That's right. They say, if you need to, you know, just wear red underwear. They say it's the same concept as tying a string around your finger. Yeah. They say, if you need to get yourself punched up, just pull those babies out and look at them. Right? They say, oh yeah, more excited and more enthusiastic. Uh, I tried that. That doesn't work either. You want to get excited and enthusiastic, uh, don't wear any underwear. Because <laughs> that'll get the adrenaline flowing right now. Okay? Look at this here. You know what this is here? Up and down, up and down. You know what that is? That's a new distributor's psyche. That's what it is. New distributor's psyche. Up and down, up and down. Let me tell you what happens to a new person when they come and look at our business. They get real excited when someone invites them down to see the opportunity, right? And they come down here, they kind of get real excited down here, and then they come and they see it. They really are thinking exactly like I was thinking over 13 years ago. Well, you know, it's really not for me. And it's, you know, it's going to be for others, but not for me. But they get there. And they say, hey, this product sounds good. They start seeing a few of the people said, that guy's not any different from me or she's not any different from me. Maybe I can do this thing. And say, everybody's into health and nutrition. What the heck? you got to try something. Let's try this. So let's say it's a couple. And they get all excited and they say, I'm going to start off with that senior consultant's merchandising pack. Let me start out right now. I'm going to go on this deal. Okay? They get home and they're all excited and you're talking to them that night. And they get home and the husband and wife is heading home and say, Hey, boy, this is really something. We're going to go on. We should not be spending you know, only $285. But let me tell you, we, we can get it back. We can get it back. We'll use that vacation money. We got it. We're okay. And maybe this thing will work out well. And they're all excited that night and they stay up a couple hours extra talking about it. Next morning, something real interesting happens. They both wake up before the alarm clock goes off. <laughs> and they're lying there perfectly still not talking to each other and not moving, looking straight up at the ceiling. And they got this strange feeling inside their stomach. And they don't know if they've got the flu or they're in love again. Right? <laughs> you know the feeling. And it's neither one. It's their $285. Right? <laughs> and they're way down here. 
He doesn't want to say anything to her because he's afraid if he does, she's going to say, I told you so. <laughs> she doesn't want to do the same thing because of that, right? The next couple of days, boy, the kids get yelled at a lot and the dog gets kicked. Uh, everything, nothing is going smooth there. Now, finally, he comes home from work and he says, honey, it's Tuesday night and John's going to the meeting tonight. Let's go. It's going to be something. And she perks up and they get ready and they're heading down to the meeting and they start talking now. See, they went from here, they were up here, down here, now they're up here, right? They're up here, that's where they are. And he says, you know something, honey? I, was, I didn't want to say anything about it. I'd just been sick. You know, I, I haven't been myself the last couple of days. And I started thinking, what are we doing in this business? You know, we don't know anything about sales. We don't have any, you know, I did, you know, all I am is plumber. You know, I need to be doing this stuff here. And, and the money we spent, we could, I, I could buy you new clothes. And I could do a lot of things. Just like, but I'm telling you, I got a good feeling about this herbal life thing. And John's excited about it, too. He said he thinks he could do something like this. And he knows a couple people who want to do it. I said, I think we've got something going. This is really something. She says, you know, I've been experiencing the same thing. And, and I feel good about herbal life, too. I think this is something. They go down there, and that night they get there, and they start shaking hands. And, Hi, my name is John. My name is Mary. Ah, you know, and, and, and I'm a new singer, and this is something. Moving on, going on and on. Five minutes to eight, John hasn't showed up yet. Two minutes to eight, and they're out looking like this. Seven minutes after eight, they're convinced that John is not coming, and they slip out the back door going home. <laughs> way down here, right? And you know the conversation on the way home? You know, maybe this business isn't for us after all. We don't have any sales experience, no business. And you know, if it was a different time of year, maybe it'd be better. Maybe we made a mistake. Well, let's try and get our money back anyway. Okay? Things rock along for about a week. And then all of a sudden, he talks to Frank. Frank says he's coming. He's going to meet them at his house next Thursday night. And they're all going over together. And he's really excited about this. Right? So, here comes Frank, right? And, he, and, the, and the Frank, they get Frank down the meeting. All three of them go down the meeting together. And they're all excited. And Frank sees it. And he says, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. You can't miss with a product line like that. And the people around here, if they're willing to help you the way it all seems, this thing, it's, this is wonderful. So you, listen, you can forget about building an organization. You can retire off of me alone. <laughs> Got it? Woo, way up here. They take Frank home and they go out for a drink, right? And here's the conversation. You know, we've been up and we've been down in this business, but I just feel so good about herbal life. I know it's the best thing that's ever happened to us. And maybe in another six months, I'll be full-time and the two of us can work together and we can do all the things we ever wanted. We can fix up the family room. We can get the new car. And we can have that. And this is so good. I'm just so excited about herbal life. Frank backs out. Woo! <laughs> You know, it's the wrong time of year, and we haven't had any experience of this before, right? Is that how, how many experience? Let me see your hands. Okay. The rest of you, hang on. <laughs> it's going to get you. Because this is what happens. Okay? But let me point out something. Do you think that this is only reserved for new distributors? Do you think all distributors go through this? Yes. You bet your life they do. Do you think I go through this? Absolutely. The difference is, let me tell you the difference. If I invite somebody and they don't show, do I get disappointed? Yes, but not for two or three days. Two or three minutes. If I've got someone that I'm counting on joining my business and they don't, am I disappointed? Yes, but not for two or three weeks. Maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And you just got to start hacking away at the time. You got to go, you're not, this is not going to switch for you overnight. You're going to hack away at it. Instead of two or three days, it's going to be a two and a half days. And then it's going to be a one and a half days. You're going to start moving on it. All you've got to do with any of these things, you're not going to go from here to here. You've got to be a little bit better at it today than you were yesterday. You've got to be able to control your attitude just a little bit more today than you did yesterday. You've got to be a little bit more excited today than you were yesterday. You've got to be a little bit more sincere today than you were yesterday. You've got to be a little bit more effective today than you were yesterday. You don't go from here to here. You do it like this, a little bit at a time. Never let a day go by that you stay the same. Because I'm going to tell you something, you're either going up or you're going down. We don't stay the same, and if you're not going up, check the gauge, it's heading down. You have no choice in this matter at all. And the only way I know to control this is with the facts. That's how I keep my attitude up, is with the facts. 
So you got to get excited and you got to be enthusiastic. But sincere excitement and enthusiasm only comes from the facts. Here's something else you've got to have in your attitude. Deadly serious. You say, hold it. How am I going to be excited and enthusiastic and deadly serious at the same time? Here's a scale that we all fit on. Up here, deliriously excitement. Down here, deadly serious. Everybody fits in there someplace. Now, if you're the type of personality that's always so enthusiastic about something, no one's going to want to look at your products or your opportunity because nothing can be that good. Right? If you're the type of personality that's so deadly serious, nobody's going to look at it either because it's too grim. Right? You've got the blend in here. Of course you want to come. Someone says, you're excited about this. You're, you, you don't have to tell them this. Your attitude tells them. You bet your life I'm excited, but I'm serious about it too. This is the finest opportunity I've ever seen. That's got to come across in your attitude. It does. You'll see somebody come in here and they'll go right to the top right now. It's because they're able to handle that. They feel strong about the products. They feel strong about the marketing. They feel strong about themselves. It's not their talents. It really is it. It's how they feel about it. Okay, does this make sense to you? Deadly serious in your attitude. You bet your life you dare deadly serious. You'd be deadly serious about any opportunity that you have. You'd be deadly serious about opportunity. Don't be deadly serious about skating by. Don't be deadly serious about Friday coming and it's a weekend. You'd be deadly serious about your financial future and your personal future at all times. And don't let anybody do anything that would detract you from that. Period. Especially if they're people close to you. Because people close to you are ones that get you. Sometimes. They get you. Sometimes you're wrong and say, oh, I just uh, support you 100% in this business. Anything you want to do is fine with me. I'm here. Go to it. And then they'll say, can we, hey, why don't you come on over Saturday and help me out? Say, oh, I'm going to a seminar to Bonavitch. Oh, you're going to another meeting. Right? See, that's called arrows of the tongue. Unintentional. It doesn't mean they don't love you. It doesn't mean they don't care. But that's called arrows of the tongue. Okay? It's sharp and it's piercing. And after a while, you've got to understand the facts. That's the only thing that you're going to get by with here. You can't get to the top and be successful without the facts. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about some subjects called employ yourself. We're going to talk about some subjects that I call death of a salesman. We're going to be talking about a subject called problem solving, okay? And mental diseases of attitude that can affect you. Let's talk about what is the death of a salesman. Or we could call this also death of someone in their own business. Or we could call this the death of someone in their own profession. There are certain things that hold people back. And we're going to try and talk about that. I will note this no matter if you're in the sales profession, or if you're in the acting profession, or if you're a lawyer, or a doctor, or an Indian chief, right? It really doesn't make any difference. There's one thing that here is important here. We're all salesmen. If we're going to be successful in life, we all have to learn to be salesmen. I should rephrase that. We're, we already know how to be salesmen. All of us do. Okay? Uh, we don't know it, the majority of us. The best salesmen in the world are kids. Have you ever noticed that? You see a little kid like that? A little five-year-old kid says, Daddy, Daddy, can I have an ice cream? He said, Absolutely not. We're going to eat in two hours. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, can I have an ice cream? He said, Absolutely not. I told you, you say it one more time, you're going to get it. Fifteen minutes later, the kid's licking on the ice cream. <laughs> right? Kids know just how to take it so far, right? And get what they want. So kids are the best ones. Next to kids are, are, are women. Women are the best salesmen in the world. Uh, there's been very few things, ladies, that you've ever wanted from your man that you haven't got unless you've given up on it. Okay? Uh, that's really, really something. The most important thing about sales is remember this. Salesman has an S in the middle. It means plural, more than one time, right? You can't just sell one time and now you have got the thing figured out and handled. I'll relate this to relationship. You can't make one big sale, men, to the lady of your dreams and expect that it's over. It's got to be every day that it has to take place. And ladies, the same thing goes for you, right? You don't make one big sell for your man, and then it's all over, right? It's a continual situation every single day. And you need to understand something about the salesman profession. It's the most honorable profession in the world today. 
most honorable profession. And it is the most professional profession in the world today. Everyone says, well, I'll tell you what the backbone to uh, America is. It's the farmer, right? You let the farmer stop producing food for 30 days and very little is going to happen. You say, well, I'll tell you the backbone. It's the, it's the, uh, the legal industry. You let every, all the lawyers and the, all the judges shut down for 30 days and nothing much happens. Let the medical profession shut down for 30 days and nothing much happens. Let the salesman stop selling for 30 days and it stops everything. It's the most highly respected profession in the world. It's also the most highly paid profession in the world is salesmen. It's not doctors, it's not lawyers, right? It's salesmen make more money than anybody else. And I'm talking about true salesmen. Not someone that you walk down to a department store and they have a little badge that says salesperson. And I'm just using salesmen here, and, uh, and you ladies just have to understand it's easier to say than salesperson, right? You have to go with me on that deal. But just because someone has a tag here that says salesman doesn't mean that they are. It might mean that they're order takers. True professional salesmen are the highest paid individuals in the world. And the highest paid in the sales field is in what industry? Direct sales industry. Make more money than anybody else in the world. So you've come to the right place for opportunity. You also, you come with the right credentials. You know what you need to take advantage of this? Zero. You need desire and willingness. You need burning desire. It takes three things to succeed, and I encourage you to write these down. It takes a burning desire to improve yourself financially. See, I don't care if a person's earning 500 a month or 5,000 a month. They could be a financial failure either way. The key is, are they succeeding in their goals? Are they getting what they want for them and their family, whether it be 500 or 5,000? Isn't that the important thing? Somebody says, oh yeah, I'm, doing, I'm making real good money. Question is, compared to what? Right? Compared, the only thing you need to be comparing it to is not someone earning less than you. You need to be comparing it to are you succeeding in your goals for you and your family? And if not, the question has got to be asked, why not? It isn't because you don't have the experience and it isn't because you don't have the time. It's none of those things. The real issue is just you. So death of the salesman here we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about salesmen, how important it is, and we're going to talk about what can kill it. And uh, all of you need to understand about how important the sales profession is. Sometimes we think bad of salespeople, right? Because you got a limit, you got stuck with something. But what you need to do is turn that around. You need to think of the most, your most important, your, 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 any object that you have in your home, that you like, or your, your clothes, or car, stereo, bed, plants, anything that you have, that, they means, that means a lot to you. I want you to notice something, that you bought that from a salesperson. Understand? And you think well of them. You think of them as someone that's nice. And a good salesperson makes you feel good about it because they continually to sell you on it. And that's not negative. I mean, they're telling you what, they're telling you the truth, right? But they're continually making you feel good about it. Here's what a salesman is. A salesman is a mind maker-upper. That's what a salesman is, a mind maker-upper. And because the mind fluctuates, the salesman has to do what? Continue to make it up, right? Remember I said in a relationship, you can't just make one big sale and you got it? Because the mind fluctuates. If you want to know why relationships don't do what they want, because the mind fluctuates. You have to continually make the mind up here. You have to continually to work on it. Okay? Now, I want to talk about death of a salesman. Death of someone being in business for themselves. Death of any type of professional individual. I have to use a story here. Maybe that will help out. You ever, we've all known somebody like this. Maybe... The guy at the gas station, right? He keeps the gas station going. He keeps everything, all the customers happy. He keeps everything moving, everything going. And uh, you, he's the best mechanic. He treats everybody nice. And you say, I don't understand why Bill does not go out there and get in business for himself. He is just so talented. He would just do wonderful for himself. Made a fortune for his boss. Why doesn't he get in business for himself? Right? We've all seen that. Bill finally gets into business for himself. He lasts six months, goes bankrupt, and back working at his own place. Right? He gets back here while he's gone. His boss has just gone. His, his, his boss's business has gone down the tubes. Right? He's so glad to get back there. Now he gets back there and he picks his boss's business up and it takes off from, from, like crazy. Right? We've all experienced something like that. Well, what happened? What's the difference here? Is it because Bill doesn't have the talent? It's that Bill has some things that he was lacking in his character that showed up when he was his own boss. 
it, it was to his advantage when he had his when he had a boss, but it was a, a, a detriment over here when he didn't have one. And I'm going to go over those with you. Okay? And here's what I want to talk about: keeping prior habits. And I want to talk a little bit about habits. Okay? We all have habits. Everything we do is a habit. The way we talk is a habit. The way we walk is a habit. The way we relate is a habit. The way we eat is a habit. The way we drive is a habit. See, everything we do is a result of a habit that we have. Our success in life or failure in life or mediocrity in life is a result of our habits in life. Not anything else, our habits. So if we want to change that, then we need to go to work on our habits. Right? That's the thing that we need to, to go to work on and zero in on. A bad habit. You hear the thing that a bad habit's hard to break? Right? We've all heard that. Well, let me tell you what else is hard to break. A good habit. A habit is a habit. The fact that it's good or bad happens to be that it's relative to the individual in the situation, right? Bill over here had some habits that was good ways in, in working for someone else, but when he got into business for himself, he fell right on his face, right? So a habit is a habit. The only way that you can do anything with a habit, the only way that you can change a habit is you've got to replace it with another habit. That's all. You've got to just change it with another one. You've got to make that the predominant issue here, and then you can alter it. So keeping prior bad habits. And I'm going to talk to you about a couple of them here that will get you in business for yourself. One here is lying to yourself. Lying to yourself. We have a tendency, the most honest people in the world have a tendency to lie to themselves. To lie to themselves. Tell yourself a lie. Very easy to do when you get in this business and you find yourself going well, and the next thing you do, you find yourself going full time. And you get out there full time, you do great here for about two months, and then you start going downhill. It takes about two months after being full time for it to start catching up with you. Right? Because I tell you what happens. You have only so much time when you're part time to make it work, and you've got your momentum going, and it's working for you. You say, okay, my income is up, I feel stable with this thing, and your decision to go full time is accurate. Right? And then that momentum keeps carrying you for about another month or two months. What happens in your business today is not a result of what you do today. It's a result of what you did yesterday. What happens in your business in the month of March has nothing to do with what you do in March. It's what you did in February. Right? And then you start, you say, oh, I did all this and all that. And then all of a sudden, you change a couple things in March. And all your business keeps going, your production keeps climbing, your income goes up, your sales goes up. You said, I'm doing the right thing now because I changed this over here and look what's happened. It has nothing to do with what you're doing now, it's because of what you did over here. Okay? So, when a person gets in this business and they go full time, their decision is accurate. But then they change a couple things that they're doing. They change it. Just a little bit. And they're, because their production keeps climbing, they think, this is what I need to do. And then next month, it starts falling off. And then they start doing footwork again. They don't know what to do. There's only one thing you do. It's called back to basics. And write that down. Basics. you got to do basics. For those of you that are sports fans in here, you understand this. Let me follow basketball very close at all. I didn't, I didn't used to follow basketball. Basketball is very exciting. And I had no idea it was at all. And I got into it. Uh, and and I, I really like basketball now. But in basketball, you can go along there and a team can, all of a sudden, you got to, you, the reason I like basketball is so fast. I mean, back, boop, boop, it's just going, their points and everything is hitting it. And all of a sudden, you can go along there and a team can make no points at all. Three, four minutes, five minutes, and they put no points on the board. Now, if they're scoring a lot of points, they know what to do. They keep doing the same thing, right? But what do you do when you're not scoring a lot of points? Very simple. The basics. You keep doing the basics over and over and over and over again. You stick to the basics. It's called the hot hand in basketball and sports. So all of a sudden you go along there, no points at all. Three, four, five minutes, no points. And all of a sudden someone gets a hot hand and 15 points goes on the board like that. And everybody knows what to do. They capitalize on a hot hand. But what do you do when you don't have a hot hand? Basics. 
basics. Keep doing the basics. And there's only a handful of basics here. And I'm going to talk about some of these things here. We're going to come down to it. We're going to give you a couple, and then I'm going to show you how to work it out here. Now, one of them is lying to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Lie to me. Lie to your sponsor. Lie to your spouse. Lie to your neighbor. But don't lie to you. Tell yourself the truth. Have the ability to see it as it is and call it as it is. You don't have to work a lot in this business. This is the easiest business I've ever seen in my life. Okay, I've done a lot of things in my, been in a lot of businesses and made a lot of money in a lot of businesses. But I'll tell you, I've never done anything like this. This is the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. Maybe I shouldn't be telling you that. But it, I'm telling maybe I shouldn't. You know, I'm hesitant, but it is easy. When my sister can start 90 days later have a royalty check of $2,010.88 or third month, that's unheard of. Okay? That is unheard of. So, it's an easy business to do, but don't lie to yourself about what you're doing. Tell yourself the truth. All you need is eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, five days a week, every single day, every single week, for three months straight, and you'll never have to worry about your financial future again. When I first went full-time, I was told, all you've got to do, Larry, is work half as hard here as you did in construction work, and you'll be wealthy quick. And I said, let me at it. When I first went full-time, I was told, all you've got to do, Larry, is work half as hard here as you did in construction work, and you'll be wealthy quick. And I said, let me at it. Half as hard, I'll work twice as hard. Right? Didn't work that way at all. Because of habits. You understand? Habits. What I'm lying to yourself. Lying to yourself says, oh, it's coming. I got it going now. I got it coming now. Right? Well, where is it? Is the only thing you've got to ask yourself. Where's the production today? Some people get so engrossed putting projects together, brochures together, big schemes, booklets, everything else together, and they didn't produce today. They didn't make one sale today. They didn't recruit one person today. They didn't really seriously talk to anybody about the products or the opportunity today. I'll tell you how to make 5000 a month in this business. I'll tell you how to do it and take 90 days. If you'll do two things. Number one, you'll sell the product at every opportune moment. That doesn't mean that you go out here and go door to door. It doesn't mean you get party plans. It doesn't mean you hustle for office buildings. It doesn't mean that. Sell the product at every opportune moment. Wear your button, open your ears, open your eyes, pay attention. Sell the product at every opportune moment. Every opportune moment. And sponsor 10 people a month. Now, I've told this to some of you before. Okay? And I'll tell you this, there's not a person that's heard just before that did it is making less than 5000 a month, period, over and out. That's what I told my sister to do. And that's exactly what she's doing. That's something. That's all she's doing, is those two things. Sponsor 10 people a month, that doesn't mean 11 in March, 9 in April, 10 people every month, and sell the product at every opportune moment you can, and you know, 5000 a month is yours. It's waiting for you. But don't lie to yourself here, okay? Who'd you talk to today about the products? Who'd you talk to today about the opportunity? Don't tell me what's going to happen next week with all these big plans you have. Don't you do that. What'd you do today that made a significant difference in your financial future? What was it today? You don't need to be, you know, you're the only one that's got to have the answer to that question to tell you the truth of it. Anybody else tell what you want. Okay? I'm going to give you some problems here, but I'm going to give you a solution to it. Procrastination. I don't know how to spell it, so you're going to have to... Do... I was going to look it up this morning, but I thought I'd do it on Monday. Uh... <laughs> Just wanted to see if you're awake. <laughs> okay. Procrastination. How many have procrastinators? Okay. All of us are procrastinators. All of us are. There's not a person in the world who's not a procrastinator in some areas. Procrastination. Procrastination took me a while to understand. And I had to relate it. There was a couple of things that really got to me, okay? And that it, I didn't think I was going to be able to make it. Even though I was making money and stuff, it, was, it wasn't secure money to me. See, it wasn't any of that stuff because I didn't think I was going to be able to get it put together. And procrastination was one part of it. And it took construction work to get me back to understand procrastination. Um, 
I couldn't understand it. Some things I'd just keep putting off and off and off and off, and other things I'd do right now, and I just didn't have any handle on it. We're in the nutritional business, but I'm going to tell you right now, my favorite sandwich in the whole world, I love sandwiches. I mean, I don't like, I mean, I love them. I just love them. And my favorite sandwich in the whole world is a fried bologna sandwich. Have you ever had a fried bologna sandwich? Oh, let me tell you. You've never had one in the world like I can make it. Sometimes I will prepare a fried bologna sandwich and you'll, you'll never believe it. You'll never be the same again in your life over this time. When I did construction work, you know what I had every day? Fried bologna sandwich. And oh, you got to eat it right. It's got to be prepared right. And it's got to be eaten right. It's so good. You have no idea. And um, it was, I, would, I guess I'd been in, in, in sales about a year. And, um, and I was, you know, having, I was making money and everything, but I was having uh, some rough times because I was, it wasn't secure, as I said. You know, I was nervous about it all the time. And, uh, and it was a day that I planned to be off, okay? And it was, and I wanted to do some work. It was, it was in, matter of fact, it was in March. And, uh, and I wanted to be off and I wanted to do some work on my deck. I was building a deck out there and I'd been piddling around with it and I was going to take a, a day and really get on with it. And I was there by myself and I never will forget it. And I didn't want to eat anything in the morning at all because I don't like to get all bogged down. And, uh, and I had it figured out where I could do X amount of work and probably stop about one, rest a little bit, and prepare a fried bologna sandwich and eat it leisurely at 2 o'clock. And it was going to be so good. And I kept working, right, and working on it. Finally, I got down. It was time to eat my fried bologna sandwich. Time to take off. I did. I prepared it. And all of a sudden, I'm eating this fried bologna sandwich. It had been a while since I'd had one, okay? Because I hadn't been, you know, eating, uh, doing construction. It had been a while. And for some reason, this fried bologna sandwich didn't taste nearly as good to me as I felt like it should. And I and that was bothering me. You know, I, I trained myself enough to pay attention to things that didn't feel quite right, to analyze them and figure it out and change it. And I couldn't figure it out. And then it got me. I understood it. You know what it was? How many of you like the crust on a sandwich? I don't like the crust. It's terrible. Right? I don't like eating the crust. But you also can't throw the crust away. They're starving kids in India. Right? You know, <laughs> your mother puts you through that deal. Right? So you can't throw the crust away. And so what do you do? Right? And I looked at that sandwich, and that baby was, I started over here in this corner, and I'd start eating around, and it was in, in and up here that I was going to have this big piece of crust left at the end. You know, it's dry. It's terrible tasting. Nothing good about that deal at all. And then it hit me. I figured it out. And I related that to procrastination. And I said, I know how to do it now. Make the whole sandwich taste good from start to finish. You know what you do? Eat the crust first. You get on with the crust. You get just enough to get into the, to the bread, right? And you get just enough crust to get in there and get rid of that so you can get to the good stuff. And you don't mind eating the crust because you can get on with that deal and you got this whole thing left that's all good. And then you get down to the last bite, which is the heart, right? Which is all the good stuff is in the heart. Everything is there. In the maximum, whatever you have on your sandwich, it's all in the middle of the good stuff, right? And that's the best bite, right? So you save that for last. So the point is, on procrastination, all of us procrastinate in some areas of our life, right? But we procrastinate when we're doing things we don't like to do. We hurry up and do the stuff that we like to do, and we put in the stuff we don't like to do. And while we're doing the things we like to do, eating the bologna sandwich, we're thinking of the crust, and we're not enjoying this to the full capacity. Right? So if you eat the crust first, the crust is more palatable because you've got all of this to look forward to. So all that means is that the things that you don't like to do, you do first. And while you're doing them, they're more enjoyable because you're looking forward to the things that you do like to do. Okay? Does that make sense to you? All of us procrastinate. All of us do. But the thing to, on procrastination is, do the things you don't like first and look forward to the others. Okay? Now here's another one. Failure to set good goals and plans. Now everybody that you've ever met that's successful has always said you've got to have goals and plans. Well, that's one thing that almost hung me up. I didn't think, I attended seminars, and they call it the art 
of setting goals. Can you believe that? The art. I've been to a six-hour seminar. The art of setting goals. And I thought I couldn't master that. Right? I got all thought. I couldn't master. I said, I don't know how to put, but, you know, I have goals. They say, write it down, write on a three-by-five card, put it in your paper, in your pocket, read it in the morning as soon as you get up, read it at night before you go to bed. They teach you all that stuff, right? I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying do that. But there's, there's something else you need to know. You already know how to do it. I, did, I thought, I wrote it down, nothing happened. I read it, nothing happened. I don't know how to make plans. I don't know how to follow up. I didn't know how to do that. I was making money. I was moving ahead. But it wasn't with ease. You understand? It wasn't so secure movement forward. And then I realized something. And that was that made a lot of difference to me. And what I realized was I didn't know how to set goals. You know why? Because I'd had some goals in my life. I didn't write them down. All of us in this room know how to set goals. All of us right now know how to make plans to achieve those goals right now. You don't have to read any books. You don't have to go to any seminars. You don't have to do anything. You know right now how to do it. All the goal is is something that you got to have. You got to have it. And if you got to have it, you become aware of it, then you'll figure out the plans. The plans will come to you. I'm going to tell you a story. When I tell you this story, I bet you there's a lot of people in this room that can tell me a story just about like that. There's only a couple things early on in my life that I knew I wanted. One of them was my own home. I knew at the age of 13 I wanted to have my own home. And I was very aware of owning my own home. And when I was 19, I was doing construction work on, on a track of homes, and they had this one model over there that I really liked. And I just kept going back and looking at it, kept going back and walking through it. It wasn't that it was the best model, but it was the only one that I could identify with possibly being able to get, right? And so that made it the best for me. And I just kept going back and looking at it. And finally the developer said, why don't you buy it? You know, here I am, 19. I said, what, he said, why don't you buy it? I said, oh, no, I, you know, I don't have any money or anything, and I don't have any credit and all this stuff. I went through that whole thing. He said, listen, just why don't you go buy it? And he said, no, I'll help you do some, you can do some stuff around it, some extra stuff, and work out some of the down, but just go do it. And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, do it. And he walked off. So I went down the next day on Sunday, and I went in the sales office, and I wrote out a, a check, a $250 deposit. I think it was $250 to deposit to hold the house. And when I signed the papers, I mean, I went through the whole deal. It was a real deal. Because if I didn't do it, my money gone, right? So $250, a lot of money. Especially back then, a lot of money. And again, $250, the house was going to be completed in six months. I had no idea where I was going to get the money for the down payment. And I tell you what, the truth of the matter, I had no idea how I was going to come with a $250 check. That's true. But I knew somehow that baby was going to get covered before it got into the bank the next day. I knew that. Somewhere it was going to happen. Uh, somebody was going to buy something I had. <laughs> you know, my old tennis shoes, something. Somebody is going to give me that $250. Uh, so anyway, when I signed the papers on the house, I had no idea about how I was going to pay for the payment. I had no idea how I was going to qualify. But I forgot all about that once I made the, made the commitment. And I went out there when they started leveling off the lot for the foundation. I went out there taking pictures, talking to the guys. I went out there when they were doing the foundation. When I put the cement work up, I had all my friends over. Boy, we put some real special cement work in. It was just really something. I was really excited about it. And when they started putting up the walls and everything, I'd bring over all my friends. And I explained to them how the family room was going to be and how I have the master bedroom, the sliding glass doors looks out over the backyard, and how it was going to be stepped down. I went through that whole deal. They put the fireplace up, and I went out there and showed them how the fireplace was going to work. And everything. Had no idea how I was going to get the money. But you know the story. Almost to the day and the hour that it came for the final payment, for the down payment to get in there, you know what happened? I had the money. Now, I didn't sit down and write it down on a piece of paper how I was going to do it at all. I didn't do that. I didn't read it three times a day, two times a day like, I, like they teach you. And I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm saying it was just a total part of my awareness. Now, that story might, might sound unusual to you. But how many in the room had something like that happen to you? Let me see your hands. Right? That's a goal. That's a goal. You know how to set goals. You know how to make plans. You know how to do it today. The difference between $10,000 a year income and $10,000 a month income is the got to. That's all. It, has no, it only has to do with your desire, something that you've got to have. There's never been a goal in your life that you've had that you've not achieved unless you've given up on it. 
And the difference between, a person always makes enough money to pay their bill. They always do. You ever been in a situation where if I don't get another $200, the whole world's going to collapse? And sure enough, you got it. Right? Because you had to have it. The difference between $200 and $200,000 is no issue. The amount is not the issue. The amount is the desire, the amount of desire that you have. I'm telling you the reason that most people don't make $10,000 a month is they don't have to make $10,000 a month. They don't have to do it. Now, if you've got to have a $10,000 a month income, as bad as you had to have the house, or as bad as you had to have that new suit, or as bad as you had to have that vacation for your lady, or as bad as anything you ever wanted that you weren't going to give up with, I'm telling you, it's yours. It's a matter of time. It belongs to you. Just a matter of time. So you need to understand these. Now, I'm going to share one other thing with you that will bring this together for you. As far as, it's all right to understand that, but how do we put it into practice every single day? How do we go from 8 o'clock this morning to 5 o'clock this night? How are we going to do it? It's a subject that I call, employ yourself. Okay, why don't you get out a fresh piece of paper for this? Employ yourself. Habits. Remember the habits thing? You gotta replace a the only way you can get rid of a bad habit is to replace it with a good habit, right? You just gotta keep switching it. I'm gonna talk to you about employing yourself, how to employ you. Let me talk to yourself. <laughs> right? No one says it's okay to talk to yourself, but don't answer, right? Don't you buy that story? Well, you can get on with it. You want to really get excited, you can have a good conversation. Yeah, but let me tell you this. You have to learn about this, right? You know, just slap yourself around. Uh, you got to do it sometimes. I mean, you got to get intense, just like there was somebody else there. You got to talk with inflections, the whole deal. You can't say, "Well, the reason you're not doing well, Larry." Okay. I mean, that, that just doesn't cut it. I had to learn how to employ myself. Sometimes we need crutches to get us through life. Sometimes we need mental crutches to get us through life. Mental crutches. You're up here on a stage and you fall down and break your ankle. You're all by yourself. There's not one other person in this hotel. You fall down. Right here, break your ankle. You've got to get off the stage, down the aisle, down the corridor, past the coffee shop, out the front door, across the street to your parking lot, to the parking lot to get to your car. You've got a broken ankle. Can you get there? Yeah. Would it be painful? Absolutely. And if you're all by yourself, there's not one thing to help you, you can get there and absolutely you get to take a long time and you could do some irreparable damage to your ankle. Right? You're up here, all by yourself, fall down, break your ankle, but you have to find perhaps this flagpole that you can use as a crutch. And now, can you go down the corridor, across the parking lot, out to your car? Can you get there? Can you get there easier? Can you get there with less pain? Probably zero damage to your ankle. Right? So if you have the ability to have a crutch, then you need to use it. Sometimes we need mental crutches to make us successful. Mental crutches. And that's what I had to develop. It was a mental crutch. I had to play mental tricks on myself. And to do that, I had to split my personality into two people. I had to have two personalities. Larry 1 and Larry 2. Okay? Larry 1 was the boss. Larry 2 was the bossy, I guess. Okay? Now, I had to split my personality and I had to talk to myself and I had to rationalize this whole thing. You want to picture it like this. What if you found out that somebody had a position, or what, better yet, you just met someone, you got to like them, they got to like you, and you, you had no idea what kind of business it is, but you just liked each other a lot. And then after a day or so there, he says, hey, listen, I really like you. And I think you're the type of person I'm looking for for my new, my new company. And I got a position for the right person that pays $100,000 a year. And as quickly, he's got your attention, right? And you think, yeah, no, it couldn't be me, right? And he says, and I think you're the person for the job, right? Now, if that happened, someone would have your attention. 
What happens when you go out to develop, to find a job, for example, however you come in contact with somebody? If it's by virtue of the newspaper advertisement, personnel agencies, whatever it might be. When it finally gets down to where they're the basic company you'd like to work for, and you're the basic person I'd like to have, then you start talking about income, then you start talking about fringe benefits, then you start talking about days that you work, hours that you work, etc. Isn't that how it works? That's the same thing it is when you go to work here in Herbalife. The only difference is you don't have this person here that's overseeing you. Remember the bad habits? Remember the guy at the gas station here we talked about her earlier? Why he fell down? Because he kept some prior bad habits that were bad on him. Right? They didn't show up when he's working for someone else, but they did show up when he worked for himself. Larry one here, and Larry two, Larry one says, "Hey, I've talked to you enough for the last two days. I got some something that I think could fit you. Pay a hundred thousand a year." Larry two says, "Tell me all about it." Larry one explains his opportunity to it, and Larry two says, "Okay, what do I have to do exactly to do it?" Larry one says, "I need you to talk to ten people a day." Okay. Larry two says, no problem. I can talk to twenty for a hundred thousand a year. I said only ten. Okay, I need you to make X amount of sales a day, right? Five sales a day, two sales a day. Okay, and I need you to do, learn how to do meetings. And I need you to learn how to do trainings. And I need you to learn this couple, four, five, or six things here. And Larry two says, okay, I can do it. And Larry one says, "All right, when do you want to start?" And Larry two says, "Right now." And Larry one says, "How about starting on Monday morning?" Okay. And Larry two says, "Okay, I'll start Monday morning." And Larry one says, "Okay, we've already decided that we're, we're going to for this hundred thousand that you're going to work six days a week. Is that correct?" And Larry two says, "Yes." And we also decided that you're going to work uh, at least eight hours a day during that time period. Is that right? So okay. And you're going to talk to ten people a day. That's the only thing. That's the most important thing that I want. Larry two says I got it. So Larry one says, okay, what six days a week do you want to work? And he, Larry two says, oh, I don't care, right? Well, he's got to care, right? It's to his future. You ever see someone go in and say, what do you want to order at the restaurant? Oh, I don't care, right? Give me anything. Well, you know what? You get anything. You know, that's what you get. You don't get what you want. You just get whatever, whatever someone else brings you. You need to care about what happens to you in your life. So Larry, Larry two says, all right, I want to have Sundays off. And Larry one says, fine. So you're going to work eight hours a day? Yes. What hours do you want to work, Larry two? Well, I don't care. All right? Say, well, you choose it. Say, so, okay, I'll start at nine. Say, nine five, you've got it. Okay. So everything's all set. Larry Chu's excited, can't wait for her. Monday morning to come around, starts his new job, his new career, 100,000 a year. All he's got to do is talk to 10 people a day. He's got this in the bag. He can't even believe it. He's not going to believe it until he gets his first check. Not ever. He's all excited. Now, Monday morning rolls around. Larry Chu's ready to go to work. He's trying to get out the door, go do his job. He agreed to start to work at 9 o'clock. And... Um, just before it gets out the door, some things happen there with the kids and with the dog, and he gets a phone call, and he sees heading out the door, it's not 9 o'clock. It's 9.07. And he looks at his watch, he says, ooh, it's 9.07. He said, that's all right, I'll make up for it. And he goes to get in his car and starts it up, and he looks at his rearview mirror, and who do you think is sitting in the back seat? Larry One. And Larry One says, I could be mistaken here, Larry Two, but my watch says 9.07. And Larry Two instantly says, oh, you're right, it is 9.07. And I said I was going to start at 9, but you know, a lot of that told in the story. And Larry One says, hold it right now. You and I agreed that you were going to start at 9 o'clock. And the first day on the job, it's 9.07. Now, if you want to start at 9.07, Larry Two, that's fine with me. But you're going to start at 9.07 every day. It's not going to be 9.08. Whatever time you say you're going to start, you're going to start. Now, do I make myself clear? Now, if Larry 1 didn't care about Larry 2, what would he do? He'd say, that's okay, you make up for it a little bit later, right? Is that what he'd do? And what does Larry 2 develop the first day on his job? A bad habit. Larry 1 cares about Larry 2, so he's not going to allow this bad habit to creep in. Habits is what equals your income. The habits that you have is equal to your income, good, bad, or indifferent. 
and you for things to change, what's the formula? You got to change. You understand? So you got to change the habits. That's all it is, the habits. Everything's rocking along there well. And then all of a sudden, Larry won, just as he's starting to leave, he gets a phone call. Things go on two weeks here just perfectly well. He gets a phone call from one of his best friends that he hasn't seen in six years. And his friend says, I'm just around the corner. I'm coming over to see you. And he says, I'll be here. And he gets there and they get talking. They get all caught up in all the war stories, all the things that's gone in their lives. They're going on and on and on. And before you know it, it's 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And he hasn't even gone to work at all. At period. And he said, that's okay. i got Bob here. Bob is going to be better than any 10 people I could talk to today. This is going to be something. I know he's just going to do great. And he'll start the whole state of it. It's going to be wonderful. And they go on and on and on and on. Have a nice dinner that night. And it's about 10 o'clock at night. Larry Two's brushing his teeth, getting ready for bed. And who do you think standing in the shower? <laughs> Larry won, right? Larry wants to say, listen, I've been real busy today and you haven't paid any attention, but I don't remember seeing you at all. And Larry Two said, oh, you didn't, but let me tell you the story. And he ran through the story, right? And Larry One says, hold it, Larry Two. When you were doing construction work for a lousy $10,000 a year, you went to work every day. And you were there on time and you showed up every single day. And I'm paying you $100,000 a year and one of your friends comes by and you don't go to work at all? So I need more consideration than that. If you're going to not work like you say you're going to work, then we're going to adjust your pay schedule here, Larry Two. It's going to be adjusted. Now, Larry Two can look at that two ways. Well, that's being real hard. You bet your life it's being real hard. Larry One cares about Larry Two. And he's not going to let that habit start. If he lets it start, I'm telling you what's wrong. It's going to happen three weeks from Thursday. He'll be doing it every single day. He'll be starting to slack off because of habits. Lack of discipline starts to creep in. Everything God walks along there well. Until all of a sudden, one day, Larry, one, Larry Two is supposed to talk to ten people, and he only talks to eight people. And he's heading home. He said, oh my goodness, it's just been a terrible day, but I'm telling you, these eight that I talked to are better than any twenty that I could have talked to. This is going to, oh yeah, these eight are good. He pulls up in the driveway, and who do you think is leaning next to the garage door? Larry One. Larry One says, oh, I've been real busy and everything, and I haven't talked to you lately, but I only counted eight. And Larry Two said, oh, it was eight, but da 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 And said, Larry Two, I pay you for ten a day, not eight a day. If you want to get paid for eight a day, fine, we'll adjust it. But I ain't going for any eight. And Larry Two says, you're right. And he gets in his car and he pulls out the driveway. And the first car that has two people in, he says, pull over, right? <laughs> he is hungry and he wants to go home. <laughs> See, here's the tendency. The tendency is for Larry too to say, sure, so what? It's 907. So what? I don't have to be that strict. But so what if I miss a day and one of my friends come over? All right, well, let me not only talk day to day. Big deal. You know, I'll make up for it. The tendency for Larry too is to say, I'm doing okay. Maybe I'm not getting there all, but I'm doing okay. Let me tell you this. You didn't get into herbal life to do okay. Every single one of you in this room was doing okay before you found Herbalife. That's not why you're here. If you got here to do okay, you're doing entirely too much work. There's a better place to spend your Saturday afternoon than here with us if you want to do okay. Okay, everybody does okay. There's no big deal about doing okay. They don't write you up in LA Times or People Magazine for doing okay. Okay? It's no big deal. There's no commendations for doing okay. Nothing happens. Your family doesn't look up to you for doing okay. Your wife doesn't go out here to get you special dinners for doing okay. That doesn't happen. You get okay responses for okay effort. You got into herbal life because you want to do excellent. You got into herbal life because you want to do outstanding. That's why you got into herbal life. You want to do exceptional things. Not okay. It's too hard to be here to do okay. You can do other things and be okay. You've got to learn to employ yourself. Understand? Habits. Remember that habit situation. Now, I'm going to draw you a picture here. And I'm not much of an artist, so I'm going to have to explain it. And then I'll show you a picture that kind of draw it, put it all together for me. 
I learned this and play yourself. I had to learn that stuff. Nobody showed me this. No one explained procrastination to me. I had to learn it. You can find out your own stuff. These are things just to stimulate your thinking here that get you hopefully going the direction that you want to go. Now, you know how to build an organization, right? You know who to look for. We talked a little bit about controlling your thinking. We talked about bad habits and lying to yourself, procrastination. That We showed you how to employ yourself. Now I'm going to give you a picture here that will bring the whole thing together. And this picture, what I'm going to draw for you up here, this little box, and you need to put this on your notes, this is a projector. And this projector is much like the projector that we show the slide presentations on, the film presentations on at night. Now, if you're going to have a, a movie projector here, you're going to need some things to make your movie, movie projector by itself is nothing. You've got to have some elements. One thing that you need, you need a screen, right? You're going to see it. You also need some films, don't you? There's a list of films. Now, if you have these series of films, whatever film, in here we have choice. This is real important to understand. We have a projector, we have a screen, we have films. In between the projector and the film, we have choice, which means we choose the film. Right? We choose the film, or what film we put in the projector, everything's working right, it shows up on the screen. Now you invite me over to your house. Say, I got a bunch of new films. Right? G give me the names of some new films that you guys have seen. Elephant Man. American Pop. Jazz Singer. Stir Crazy. Okay, that's enough. Okay? Now, you invite me over here. I say, oh, I got these new films. You're not going to believe it. And I say, I'm coming. I'll be there. And I show up and we do the chit-chat. We get all down. We get comfortable in talking and everything. And I said, okay, I'm ready. And you say, what film would you like to see? And I said, oh, I've got to see American Pop again. you got to lay it on me. I said, okay. He says... I'll get the film and the projector. I'll get all set up here. And you get the, the popcorn and, and the natural popcorn, of course. And, <laughs> you know, you get it all set up here. And then we'll watch the film. It's going to be something my new sound system is in. It's wonderful. I said, all right, I can't wait. Got the popcorn. He's got the film loaded. He said, okay, let it rip. We chose to see American Pop. Now, lights go out. Projector goes on, light comes on, on the screen, the credits start to roll, and instead of American Pop, it's Elephant Man. And I said, I thought we were going to see American Pop. And he says, me too. And I say, you got the wrong film in the projector, right? If Elephant Man is showing on his screen, what's in the projector? Projectors aren't known for playing real tricks. You know what I mean? They're, they're pretty conservative. Uh, they don't do radical things, okay? So do we agree that if Elephant Man is showing on the screen, that Elephant Man is in the project projector? No matter what he says, right? No matter what he thinks, Elephant Man's in the projector, period, over now. We all buy that story, okay? Now we're going to change this just a little bit. We're going to change these films. We're going to call this film positive. We're going to call this film negative. We're going to call this one success. We're going to call this one failure. We're going to call this one love. We're going to call this one hate. We're going to call this one happy. We're going to call this one sad. The screen becomes the screen of life. The projector gets changed just a little bit, and we're now going to call this the mind. Choice is exactly the same. Now, person says, I have a real positive attitude, but negativity is showing up on the screen. What's in the projector? Negative. Negativity. Person says, well, my thinking straight. Person has con consistently failure showing on their screen. What's the answer? They got the failure film in the projector. Person that has success on the film, on the screen, what do they have? Success in the projector. Happiness, sadness. Person's constantly sad, concerned, frustrated, always this, right? 
They got what film is in the projector? Sad film. They want to be happy with it. They plug in a happy film. Now, who says, well, I'm doing real good here. You know, I'm real positive. And they have a blowout at 4 o'clock on the Harbor Freeway, right, right out here, and they have a blowout. Right? Now, that's a true test of your attitude. What's going to happen now? What are you going to do now? Your attitude is going to show what's in your projector is going to show on the screen now. Not when everything's going smooth. When there's adversity is when you find out what you really think and really believe in adversity. Anybody can look good when things are going well. Well, what about adversity? What do you do then? That's when your true colors come out. Whatever is on the screen is in the projector. And not only do you see what's in there, everybody around you sees what's on your screen alive. Now, when I realized this, I said, you mean to tell me, remember my thing? 25,000 years, all I could think. Remember my deal? Construction work, that's all I could think. I could only see past that one little house that I was going to get. That one deal is all I could do. I became aware, and I put more things into my projector now. And I'll tell you, when I first realized this, I went to work on this one in a positive-negative sense. Positive, negative, positive, negative. And I'd be going along there, and every two or three minutes, I'd have to change my film. Every two or three minutes, I'd be going along there and say, oh my goodness, I've had the negative film in for the last two minutes. And I'd just reach down there and plug it in, right? You think that's okay? For about two minutes. Then I had to, you know, switch them back and forth. And today, I have to do it. Today, I'll be going along and I say, no wonder things have been going bad. You've had the wrong film in the projector for two days. Two days. And then I put the right film in and I'm all right for two or three weeks. I still have to do this. Just like you're going to have to do it. Okay? Fine. Whatever's on the screen is because you've got it in here. Remember, the key factor here is choice. What you want to do with it. Okay? Now covering a lot of ground fast here because we're going to get it all done. I want to talk to you about problem solving. These are all things that you're going to have to learn how to handle. You're going to have to learn how to do it. Success is a habit. Unfortunately, so is failure. Vince Lombardi said it. He said winning is a habit. He said, but so is losing a habit. And when Vince Lombardi built the dynasty that he built with the Green Bay Packers, when he built that dynasty, which nobody thought that he could do, when his team was out there on that field playing ball and they would win the game, and they came back and they looked at the films the next day, and if they played sloppy, he got on them more for that when they won, playing slop sloppily, than he did when they didn't. Now why would he do that? Because he understands habits. He understands it. You've got to correct these habits. You've got to work on the habits. One of them is problem solving. We've got to talk about problems here. Now, to talk about problems, I'm going to have to draw you another picture. You'll never know what this is. Who can guess what that is? Amoeba. <laughs> That's a walnut. This guy's going to make me feel bad. I thought somebody would get it. It's a walnut. Okay? What happens? Why do you crack a walnut? You get inside. Why do you want to get inside? Because the goodies are inside. All the goodies are inside the walnut. Right? So the walnut right here does you no good. But if you crack the nut, you get inside to the goodies. And you get to eat all the goodies. And you're entitled to it because you cracked the nut. Right? Problem solving is a lot like walnuts. <laughs> it is. You have to learn to solve problems. Here's a, here's a formula. Problem solving equals maturity. Problem solving equals maturity. Maturity equals personal growth. Personal growth equals production. 
and you've got to produce. So you've got the problem solving equals maturity. Maturity equals personal growth. Personal growth equals production, which is your income. Then my point to that is don't shy away from problems. Don't see how many problems you can get away from. See how many problems you can get into to solve. The bigger the problem, the bigger the paycheck. Remember that. If you solve just everyday problems that everybody can solve, then that's called an average problem solver, average income. The only difference between someone making a living and someone making a fortune is they ask for bigger problems to solve. Mark Hughes asks for a big problem to solve. How to get fine quality natural herbal products in the market to control people's weight that would be good for them and get it at an economical price and to develop up an organization to do it. That was a problem that Mark Hughes had 13 months ago. He solved it. That's all. Yes. Bigger problems. He could have had the same problem, the same intensity with the putting in his lawn in the backyard. The only difference is the paycheck. The bigger the problem, the bigger the paycheck. Okay? Let's talk about let's talk about babies here for a minute. It's gonna be interesting. Okay? Babies have problems. And when babies have a problem, when a baby has a problem, what do they how do they let you know about it? They cry, right? You know when a baby's got a problem because they cry. Let's talk about some of the problems that a baby could have. One of them could be that they're hungry, right? If they're hungry, they cry. Then you say, oh, I should feed him, right? Another problem could be sleepy. Could be tired, right? You want to go to sleep. Another one is they could be wet. <laughs> need to be changed. Or there could be another one, right? They could be stuck. You know, it means check the diaper out, right? They could have a needle in it, a spin in them someplace. It's you know, about the problems that a baby has. Now, babies don't have problems other than that. Do you agree with that? They don't have very few problems. Okay, adults have problems too. And a pro an adult that's immature goes about it the same way a baby does. They cry. They cry about the problem. They don't solve their problem. They cry about their problem. They put the problem on somebody else. Equals immaturity. Got to learn to crack the nut. Okay? So you get the goodies inside. Now, sometimes you go all the trouble of cracking this nut. Now, what do you think that is? Well, I'm just good, okay? <laughs> and you get inside, you crack the nut, and you discover that there's no goodies inside at all. There's a worm in there. Right? So you don't get paid for that. Usually, when you have to solve problems with worms in them, involving people, and you've got to remember this, the majority of the problems that you're going to have to solve in your life have very little to do with policies and rules and regulations. The majority of problems you're going to have to solve are going to be personality problems that have to be dealt with. And sometimes you'll get inside of one of these walnuts and there'll be a worm in there. And that's called self-inflicted problems. A lot of people have self-inflicted problems. They want you to help crack the walnut to take, for one thing, they need attention. They need attention. You've got to find out what's good walnuts and bad walnuts. You can use it. If you examine a walnut real closely, you can generally tell, right, if there's going to be a worm in there. You can tell it. But sometimes they'll fool you. Sometimes you'll crack it and you go all the way through and then you'll find it there. But when you find a walnut with worms in it, and there's no goodies. There's no growth either. There's no growth from them. You don't grow from it. There's no rewards from it, but you've got to suffer through them. You've got to suffer through them because you're a nice person. That's why you've got to do it. Okay? There's two types of problems you can't solve. One of them is an emotional involvement, one that you have an emotional involvement with. You can't solve that kind of a problem. If you do, you'll come up with the wrong decision if you're emotionally involved in it. If you're emotionally involved, you've got to turn it over to somebody else. 
anything you're emotionally involved in, you'll come up with the wrong decision. And the second one that you can't solve is when your hammer isn't big enough. You need more experience to be able to handle the situation. So you've got to call on your sponsor. You've got to call on somebody else to solve it. You've got to call on someone you care that you have confidence in. A third person, perhaps. But your hammer's not large enough to solve that problem. Okay? Now, in solving problems, here's the thing. Write this down. There's no perfect solution to anything. Humanity does not have perfection, period. There's no perfect solutions. But here's what you strive for. You strive for a 51% accuracy factor. If you're 51% accurate on the decisions that you make and the problems that you solve, you are going to win. If you're striving for 100%, you're never going to make it. You want to strive for 51% accuracy. And anything above that, you're head on. Now, when someone brings me a problem, knowing in advance that most problems are personalities, you've got to get, here's some steps to it. Okay, five steps. You've got to gather the facts. Number one, gather the facts. And under gathering the facts, put enough facts. People say, you've got to get all the facts. You're never going to get all the facts. How do you know you got them all? How do you know when you don't make the decision that one more fact comes in that you didn't realize that you had? You're never, you're never going to get all the facts. You've got to get enough facts. And enough facts means that you've got enough to where the picture starts to repeat itself. Right? To it starts two or three, you start, the picture starts repeating itself from both parties. Then you've got enough facts. Now, Here's another picture I'm going to draw you. You're going to make me feel bad here. Okay? You know what? Oh. Close. You know what that is? Come on, honey. It's a pancake. Hey, nothing's perfect, right? It's a pancake. Now, here's the things about pancakes that we need to talk about. What does a pancake always have? Syrup. They don't always have syrup, and they don't always have two sides. And both never the same than the other. Right? Put the right enough facts. Okay? Things like this are what helps me remember these deals, right? There's also a thing called spotlighting. You know what spotlighting is? Spotlighting this when someone, I usually know this. Here's my rule of thumb. Whoever brings me the problem first is usually the problem, the person at fault in a personality situation, which most problems are. The first one to bring me the problem is usually wrong. It's called spotlighting. They take the spotlight off of them, throw it on to somebody else to show up some inadequacies. That's what I'm to do. They get you onto over here so that you won't see what the real is. It's spotlighting. Okay? So one is gather the facts. Two is form for possible Solutions. Every possible, there's no perfect solution. Remember? Find several, not to the correct solutions. Now, number three is you pick two. You pick two solutions. You pick what is the fairest for everybody involved. And you also do something like this. If I choose this solution this time, would it apply every time? Very important here. Because if it doesn't, you're usually, you're now probably getting involved in what? Personalities. If I choose this solution this time, would it work exactly the same way the next time the same circumstances came up? And if it can't, you need to analyze it. For example, someone says, somebody stole my prospect. Right? Possible solution is, you could shoot the guy that stole your prospect. <laughs> or you could shoot the prospect. Right? You've just got to brainstorm for solutions. Here's another part of that. you always got to find somebody that you hold in esteem, and you've got to say, how would they handle this 
situation. How would they do it? How would he do it? How would she do it? Number four is you choose the best one. Choose the best solution. Choose it quickly. Quickly. Knowing that you will make mistakes. But what's our goal? 51% accuracy. And when you choose it, here's what you judge. You judge intent. You've got to judge intent. When someone is, has done something inaccurate, you've got to judge their intent. Was there greed involved? Was there malice involved? That has a great deal to do with it. Intent. They might have done it out of intent, which means greed and malice. They might have done it out of ignorance, which means they didn't know. They honestly didn't know. They might have done it out of stupidity, which means they knew, but they did it anyway. See? Or they could have done it because they had false facts. So then you just got to act accordingly. Now, the fifth part of that is once you've made your decision, you act upon it. You act upon it. You decide, you inform the people involved, knowing in advance that everyone will not agree, but you decide. And you act on it and never look back on a decision, ever. The bigger the problem, the bigger the paycheck. When someone brings you a problem, I'm going to tell you three things here that you need to get solved. If there's a personality problem and you're doing it, you set them down and here's the first three things you say. Number one, folks, before we get started, we got to understand this. What can I do about yesterday? And what will their answer be? Nothing. That's part one. Part two is, if you're here today to be part of the problem, or you're here today to be part of the solution, it's going to determine my attitude. If you're here to be part of the solution, we'll talk. If you're here to be part of the problem, it's over. Did you come here today to be part of the problem, or did you come here today to be part of the solution? And what will they say? The solution. And then the third thing I always say is I want you to know going in, there's no perfect solution to anything. Now, if you agree to those ground rules, we'll proceed. Now, these are some things that will help you in solving problems, some concepts that will help you. You've got to get concepts down. If you get concepts down, they'll always stay with you. Techniques change constantly. Concepts stay the same. Okay. I want to just share a couple things with you here now that I feel strong about. It's called diseases of attitude. I feel very fortunate in my life that I've been exposed to the type of thinking, the type of training that we're getting here today. I can only tell you this, if it means a portion to you what it's meant to me over the last 12, 13 years, it'd be a very valuable afternoon for everybody. we got to share with you what's going to hurt you as well as what will help you. We can't just say, here's the way, here's the way. There's some things that will hurt you. We might call this the negative part of the day. Diseases of attitude are a lot like weeds in a garden. To get a good garden, you need several things, right? If you're going to grow a rose garden, you've got to have several things. Number one, you need good seeds, right? You need good soil. You need plenty of water. Most importantly, you need a real good hoe to have a good garden, don't you? If you're going to have a beautiful rose garden, that's what it takes. But in the same area of space, to have weeds, what do you have to do? Nothing. To get weeds, you don't have to do anything at all. Weeds will come up all by themselves. You don't need good ground. You don't need good water. You don't need a good hoe. You don't need anything. Weeds will crop up all by themselves. You don't have to plant weeds. Weeds are automatic. Rose garden, you have to plant. Rose garden, you have to tend. See, this applies to all areas of our life. It's almost like a man stands at the garden of his wedding, the door of his, of his marriage. And he looks out there and his marriage is in complete shambles. And he says, I didn't intend it to be this way. And of course not, he didn't intend it to be that way. Nobody intends it to be that way. But it is. And I'll tell you how things get in shambles. It's called neglect. Neglect. We'll do it every single time. One week of neglect can cost a year of repair in your rose garden, can it? 
Don't water your rose garden. Don't weed it. Don't fertilize it for one week in the heat of summer and what's going to happen. It's over for your rose garden. A person can amble around here for a while and be lost for a lifetime. You've got to tend your garden. You've got to get out the home. And here's some attitudes that we're going to talk about, diseases of attitude. Number one is indifference. Indifference. Indifference is the mild approach to life. Indifference is that shrug of the shoulder. Say, oh, you know, I can't get all that worked up about something. That's indifference. All I can tell you is if you can't get all worked up about something, you need to check your list. If it's not all, if it's not worth getting all worked up over, perhaps it's not worth doing at all, regardless of what it is. Get worked up about what you do. Swing hot or swing cold, as they say. Even the good Lord said it. I have more respect for the person that, you know, that does go all the way than the person that's in the half-baked, lukewarm middle here. Strong feelings is what we're after. Someone's always asking, what type of people do you want, do you look? What type of people do you like to be around? And my quick answer is always, strong feeling people. I don't care what they feel strong about. What I want them to do is feel strong about what they feel. I want them, I don't care, bring me whatever you want. You know, that won't work. That won't get it. That won't cut it. Kind of like back in the real early Christian days. The good Lord needed someone with strong feelings to lead the Christian movement. Back then, it wasn't like it is today. You know, you didn't put 125,000 people in the L.A. Coliseum to help Billy Graham on Sunday. Back then, you know, it wasn't good to be a Christian. Right? You didn't go out and publicize the fact that one thing you didn't do was go to the Coliseum, especially on Sundays. Right? Uh, you, the word was stay away from the Coliseum. And the good Lord needed someone to lead the charge. And he's looking around for someone, and his prime thing that he was looking for was someone with strong feelings. And he looks down there, and he sees Saul of Tarsus. You've got to understand Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was probably one of the greatest Romans that ever lived. He was all, all, also Jewish, and one of the greatest Romans. And he was very intellectual, one of the greatest debaters of the time. Saul of Tarsus was really something. You always knew what Saul was into. Because whatever Saul was into, he went all the way out for it. Everybody in the community knew what Saul was thinking. Everybody in the, new, in the community knew what Saul was doing. He was called all out Saul, right? Because he went all out for everything that he did. Saul only had one problem. He hated Christians. Uh, you know, he hated them so much that he killed them. Every place he went, he killed Christians. And because he was high up in, in, in the community, he had letters of authority to go around and kill Christians every place that he, he went, right? And he heard about a new group of Christians starting up in Damascus. You know the story, right? And he got new letters of authority, gathered some men around him, and he's smoking it to Damascus to get these new Christians. And the story goes that he was breathing thoughts, threats of slaughter. That means he felt strong about it, right? <laughs> the good Lord looks down there and needs someone with strong feelings. Said, my goodness, look at that Saul. He really feels strong. Said, that's my man, right there. And the bolt of lightning comes out of the sky and knocks him off his horse and blinds him temporarily. Right? It's a recruiting tool that you and, a recruiting tool that you and I can't use, but if you're the Lord, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Have at it. Long story short, Saul gets converted to Christianity. He becomes one of the early, the greatest champions of the early Christian movement. One of the greatest men to ever live. Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle. And uh, it was really something. See, strong feelings is what you look for. You've got to put everything you've got into everything that you do. Paul later said, the things that I once loved, I now hate. The things that I once hated, I now love. And that's called strong feelings. See, I don't care what direction a person's going in. I want them to feel strong about what they feel about. But everything you've got and everything you do, that's the formula for real success. That goes from making a fortune to kissing your lady in the morning. I will promise you that adventure awaits you in both cases. <laughs> uh, 
Number two. Indecision. Indecision is called mental paralysis. Indecision will bring you to your knees. Indecision is when a person's on the fence. They can't quite decide which way to go. Indecision is when a guy, sometimes a person knows they're crippled with this disease. The guy says, I know I'm on the fence, but I just don't know what to do. Sometimes you've got to make the decision knowing the 51% accuracy factor and knowing that you've got to get off the fence. It makes no difference what side it's on. It doesn't make any difference if you get off on the wrong side. It makes a difference is that you practice the habit of making decisions. See, a life full of adventure, a life full of success, and a life full of many decisions. Indecision is the greatest thief of opportunity. Indecision is. Indecision is the greatest thief of time. Greatest thief of happiness. You've got to learn to decide quicker. You've got to learn to decide faster. You've got to learn to decide better. Not reckless. Not careless. But you've got to decide and move on. It will bring you to your knees. Indecision will. Third one here. It's called doubt. Doubt is like a plague. The worst doubt that a person can have in their life is self-doubt. It's the worst. To doubt themselves. A person doubts, well, I don't know if I can do all that well. Why would a person entertain that thinking at all? person doubts if he can make that much. Remember the projector? If you're going to think about something, why not think about positive things? person doubts if it'll last that long. Pretty soon people get good at doubting. Pretty soon the person could be a practice doubter. Gets real good at it. And I'll tell you what happens, they end up with an empty cup. An empty cup is what's in it for the doubter. Turn the coin over and become a believer. Remember this, trust is better than doubt. Always. I'm not telling you that you're going to win with that formula every time, but I am going to tell you you're going to win with a lot more than you can win with doubt. Trust is a better deal than doubt. Here's the fourth one. It's called worry. Worry can cause you so many problems. Worry can cause you health problems. Worry can cause you social problems. Worry can cause you personal problems, economical problems, family problems, all sorts. Of worry can drop you to your knees and reduce you to a beggar overnight. Worry's a bad habit to get into. Can't be a warrior. Can't be like the little old lady in, in Cleveland. And she used to say, my goodness, you know, I can't believe this, this nuclear bombs and nuclear things going all over. I just can't believe it. She's always worried about a nuclear bomb coming. She said, if one of those things were to go off here, I'd go all to pieces. <laughs> of course she would, right? But why go to pieces before the bomb falls? Why do that? It reduce you to a beggar overnight. I used to be a super warrior. I did. Not a super warrior. Super warrior. Family wish I'd have been a super warrior, but I wasn't. Got to give it up is a bad deal. Worries, you got to treat worry like it's excess baggage. You got to substitute worry for positive action. I want you to remember this. The heavy chains of worry are always forged in idle hours. The heavy chains of worry are always forged in idle hours. Number five, over-caution. Some people are just always cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. Timid approach. Some people always test the water 
before they take the plunge. Right? They just test the water out with the toes before they take the plunge. Some people wait for better days to come. Better days are never going to be here. They're never going to be here. You've got to take the days as they are and make them into what you want them to be. Better days aren't coming. When has there been a better day? There hasn't been a better day. There's 24-hour segments that we have at our disposal for success, failure, happiness, sadness, positive, negative, 24-hour segments every single day. It's what we have. There's no such thing as better days. There's days. Period. Take the days you've, how you find them and make them into what you want them. I tell you, one of my biggest cautions always was risk. Risk. I said, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? And then what if this happens? And what about that? What if that happens? What about that one, huh? It used to be my attitude. There's always risk. Okay? Always risk. People who chronically fail always look at the risk and the opportunity. People who always succeed look at the opportunity and the risk. You can't get away without risk. Nobody's entitled to go through this deal called life without risk. Do you think you could have success and happiness without risk? It's an impossibility. Nobody gets off without having risk. It's part of our life. Let me tell you, life is risky. I'll tell you how risky it is. We ain't getting out alive. <laughs> Try that deal out. You know, someone's on, I had someone tell me, I said, you guys are always talking about opportunity, opportunity, opportunity here in Herbal Life. So what happens if I get going and all of a sudden I start building up a little bit of inventory here, start conducting my business, and I'm walking across the street, and I get ran over by a car, break my arm here, break my leg, you know, and I end up in a hospital, can't work. Who's going to take care of my family? Who's going to pay my bills? Herbal Life? The answer to that question is, of course not. I tell you what I told him, I said, listen here, when you're walking across the street, instead of it being a car that hits you, let's have it be a truck. <laughs> and not only does it break your leg this time, but it breaks your arm, breaks your back, breaks your neck, crushes your skull, you end up in a hospital, a complete vegetable for the rest of your life. How about that one? He said, don't make fun of me. I said, I'm not making fun of you. My wreck's better than yours. <laughs> you can't design a nice one-legged wreck. Can you? You can't do that. So if you can't do that, why design any wreck at all? Why look at that side of it? Someone's always looking for safety and security. So I need safety and security. Well, if you want safety and security, we'll put you in the corner. We'll get you a sheet, we'll get you a blanket, we'll bring you food and water every single day. You'll probably live to be a hundred years old. Safe and secure in a corner. You say, yeah, but what a way to live. That's right, what a way to live. Safe and secure. Sixth disease. Pessimism. The pessimist always looks on the dark side. Pessimist always looks at the reason why it can't work, why it won't work. We know the story. To the pessimist, the glass is half empty. The optimist, the glass is half full. We know that story. Just got a new place out on the beach. Boy, it's nice. You walk outside and you put your, sand, your feet in the sand. It's just unbelievable. I can't even tell you how good I feel there, and I know I look good, too. That's probably the best part about it. And you're there... I had a friend over and he says, my goodness, the taxes must be high here. <laughs> you step out and put your toes in the sand. And he says, the taxes must be high. <laughs> Can you believe that? Got a view of everything. You can't even believe the view. And he says, the taxes must be high. And he doesn't even live there. He can't enjoy the sand because he's concerned about the taxes. <laughs> Negative accountant I once worked with, he kept saying, what if we go broke? What if we go broke? And I kept saying, what if we get rich? <laughs> See, the pessimist doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. But once they find the faults, they start to enjoy the faults. The pessimist looks out the window. He doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks. 
doesn't see the beautiful painting on the wall. He sees the cracks. How ugly it is. It's ugly. We don't need to be that way. It's not becoming to anybody. I don't care who you are. It's ugly. Get rid of it. It doesn't take long for pessimism to break your life down to where it's not worth much more than a warm pitcher of spit. <laughs> Just wanted to get the point across. <laughs> Didn't want you to forget. Okay, number seven here. Complaining. Complaining, crying, griping. Spend five minutes complaining, and you've wasted five minutes. You can't complain. Who are you to complain to anybody about anything? Where do you get off complaining to somebody about something? Who are you to do that? Imperfection can't judge imperfection, period. Crying, complaining, griping, it won't work. I'll tell you a story. Story of Old Testament fame about the children of Israel. It's a good example here. Through a series of miracles, God got the children of Israel, got them free as slaves. And they're heading towards the promised land. You know how it goes. They were going to the promised land, got them free to slaves and heading to the promised land. They're free now and heading to the promised land. Not slaves anymore. Free going to the promised land. You know what happened? They start crying, condemning, complaining from day one. They complained about the food. They complained about the weather. They complained about the leadership. They complained about each other. They complained and they kept complaining and crying and condemning so long until God got it up to here, I guess. And he said, trip canceled. <laughs> they never made it. They died in the wilderness. Going to the promised land and crying and condemning and complaining. They never made it to the promised land. That's how serious that one is. Okay, those are the seven diseases. You got to know about them, you got to work on them, you got to become aware of them. All of us are here today. Because we came here today to turn our lives in a new direction. We're not here for anything else. We need to remember that deal about lying to yourself? Tell yourself why you're here today. There are a lot of other places you could be today besides spending four hours at the Bonaventure with us. You could be any place you wanted to be. You're here today because you want your life to be turned in a new direction. There's some ingredients that has to take place. There's five major ingredients, and I'm going to share them with you here. It goes in the day that turns your life around. Now, this, these ingredients have to be in a 24-hour period, 24-day, 24-month. But there's some ingredients, five major ingredients that goes into turning your life around. The first one is disgust. Disgust. You know what disgust means? Disgust means you don't like it like it is. Disgust means that you've had it up to here. You're not putting up with it anymore. No more will you live with it like this. See, a person could have it with embarrassment of not being able to pay their bills on time. They said, I've had it no more. A person could say, I've had it with giving a dollar when they always want to give more. A person could have it with that sick feeling when a man knows that his wife is down at the store shopping. And she's looking at beans, two cans of beans, one mark 37 cents, one mark 39 cents, and he's sick inside knowing his wife is going to choose the 37 cent can of beans, and she doesn't even like the brand. Do you know why? To save two cents. And the man says, I'm not living like this anymore. I have had it. No more are you going to see me on my knees in the dust looking for pennies. I'm going to do something about it. See, a man could have it with mediocrity. 
He could have it with not being some kind of winner. He could have it with not having challenge. He could have it with lack of excitement, love and caring. But when a person says, I've had it, I'm telling you, look out, that could be the day. Second ingredient, it's called decision. You have to know what you want. Almost everybody in my life that I've met can tell me what they don't want. But also, almost everybody in my life I've met can't tell me what they do want. Most people spend more time planning their three-week vacation every year than they do their future. So you've got to find out what you do want. And I'll tell you this about decision, it's not easy. Decision is not easy. Winston Churchill called it the agony of decision. You know what that agony of decision is? That sick, nausea feeling you get, that, when that cold sweat pops out on your forehead. You're lying in bed late at night, it's a midnight hour, but you've got to decide. I'll tell you what I've found out in my life. That generally making a decision is the hardest part. That's the hardest part. Of almost anything I've ever done is the decision. If a person could just wade through the heavy waters of decision, they could climb the mountain almost every single time. Third ingredient, it's called desire. You have to want to. This whole day has been about these five ingredients. You have to want to. You have to be able, you got to develop your want to. I wish that Herbalife had desire for sale. I do. I wish that we could package it in little bottles like this. Because if we could package desire, and you could take a couple of tablets, and it would increase your desire every day, here's what I'd do. I'd tell you to go home and liquidate all your assets and come back and buy everything your money will purchase. Buy every bottle of desire, because that's where it starts. I'll tell you this about desire. It comes from deep within inside you. You can't uh, clip out a coupon in a magazine and send for it. It doesn't work that way. It can't be bestowed upon you by some benevolent magistrate someplace. You have got to develop it. I'll tell you what's happened to me. Your desire can be cultivated. It can be cultivated by meeting like this today. It can be cultivated by getting involved with a group of people. It can be cultivated in a lot of ways. A lot of it comes from books that I've read, people I've met, my family. The only thing I'm sharing with you here is every single day add more weight to your want to. Ask for it. Search for it. Fourth ingredient is called action. Decision can turn you in a new direction. It, action takes you in that new direction. I'm going to give you a word to go with action. It's called massive action. All out massive action. Don't be like the distributor says, okay, I'll pass out a few brochures. He'll always be broke. Don't be like I said, okay, I'll make a few contacts. Listen, you can guess their bank account. But like the girl said, all right, I'll try a sales party and see what happens.